Oh, right. Hi there, everyone. So my name's Joe Perry and I'm the Climate Change Coordinator for the Highland Council. I'm going to be the event organiser for today. Uh, thank you very much for joining the 2020 Highland Climate Change Conference. We're going to start properly in about two minutes. So what we're going to do just now is get that video ready. So we're going to get the video ready for you guys. It's just going to load up. Good morning. Hello, welcome to our Highland Climate Change Conference. Um, I'm Margaret Davidson. Uh, I'm the leader of Highland Council and the privilege is mine uh, to welcome you all here today. Also to feel just a little bit virtuous. Here we are saving a very little bit of carbon uh, by being online today instead of uh, in person. Let's see how we get on. Over recent years, it's become crystal clear that ch climate change is the greatest and most time critical challenge that, that we face. Um, last year, I visited family in Australia. The bushfires were terrifying. We're now getting reports about permafrost thawing in Siberia and temperature rises in the deep ocean, uh, affecting uh, the biodiversity that is there. And last year, we had fires in our own flow country here in Highland. These events are becoming increasingly common as we emit more carbon and methane into the atmosphere. And it becomes ever more clear that we need to significantly ramp up our efforts to help minimise the impacts of climate change. It would be all too easy to become discouraged. And I do meet young people, um, uh, in fact, even in my own family, who are very discouraged uh, by this relentless stream of frightening news and the idea that apocalypse now is coming towards it. Well, it might be. But we need to take some heart, take some heart from uh, there are millions of people around the world that re recognize the threat and are working hard to do something about it. The ingenuity of mankind has been astonishing over the centuries uh, and we are again relying on it uh, to help us save ourselves from disaster. You're going to hear from some of those people here today. The issue of adaption is important. Um, as we know, some amount of change in global temperature is already locked in due to historic emissions. And that means that the peatlands that we have are currently shrinking. We need to work our way through that and see what we can do uh, to preserve and enhance these really important um, uh, assets that we have. So change is going to be with us whether or not we um, uh, we drop our carbon footprint to zero today. Uh, and because of that, it's not just about what we do to reduce our footprints um, and, and, and carbon over the coming years. It's about how we're going to prepare to the change which is inevitably coming. In many cases, it's already happening. So we have this twofold challenge sitting with us now. Going back to COVID-19, uh, we've had some extraordinary months, um, months when some of the things that um, we've never brought ourselves to quite do have actually happened. Um, and uh, we've got more people on bikes. Uh, we had far, far less uh, traffic on the roads there for a while. But that's um, really only um, the beginning of it. Um, we've got a long way to go. I've had, I saw a huge uh, commitment uh, to shorter, more sustainable food uh, uh, food strains in Highland. Um, people wanting to uh, shorten uh, the, um, the distribution. And very, very important, we need to have smarter workplaces. We need to think, yes, we need to, but do we need that many? Um, how much more working from home can we do? And then there is the massive challenge around energy efficiency. Highland um, has some dubious honours. We have um, extraordinary high levels of fuel poverty. We have very energy inefficient homes. And um, even though we've been um, insulating for years, it's retrospect, retrofit, and it's not been as successful as we would want. So. Very interested if we can uh, face up to that again. May 2019, uh, we're talking over a year ago now, I tabled a motion um, to declare a climate and ecological emergency and committed ourselves to working 
towards being a net zero emitter by 2025. Now, if we'll get there, I don't know, but my God, we'll be on the track and we need to do some dramatic work in the uh, to get it. You'll be hearing more about that today from our own climate change team and the Eco Officer Network throughout um, uh, from across the public sector. We're taking action and accelerating uh, change. What we need now is more common sense. Um, I think we all know um, a, a lot of the, uh, uh, the answers to this. But if we have shared goals, local organizations, communities heavily involved in dealing with climate change, those small changes will add up and will make a very big impact. Highland uh, should be and will be uh, a centre of excellence uh, around uh, uh, tackling climate change. We will have people coming to see what we're doing. We have an extraordinary landscape and potential to actually use our landscape for tree planting, uh, peat restoration um, that will give us uh, a real place on the map. I don't believe for one minute uh, that Scotland can reduce its uh, its carbon emissions without the use of Highland. And uh, we need to make the best of that that we can for our communities. And again, thank you for coming. I urge you to engage with the whole day. Um, there are some very, very interesting uh, workshops this afternoon. And do enjoy uh, being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi from Amvastia in the Coolins and Sky. I'm Donny Campbell. I am a, I would class myself as an endurance mountain athlete. Recently in August this year, I ran all 282 Scottish Monroes, cycled and kayaked in between in 31 days and 23 hours, breaking the old record by over a week. When I say run, there was actually a fair bit of power hiking, walking and crawling up the Monroes and then kind of running down and cycling in between. Where I'm standing right now it was day 25 of my Monroe round uh, and actually believe it or not I actually had blue skies and blue skies on the Isle of Skye at the time and it was a great day it was probably the highlight of my Monroe round. However it wasn't all smiles and blue skies. Day 17 was probably my lowest point so I'd been going for 17 days doing massive big days to like 12 14 hour days in the hills and then cycling in between. I just lost focus, so I was so far from the start, but I still had another 12, 14 days to go, and I was like, just lost, I just lost it, like, I, all I could think about was how far I had to go and how much suffering there was still to go, um, but thankfully, I managed to refocus and just find, kind of focus on one day at a time, just taking small goals, one more note at a time, and you know, by the time I got here, day 25, day 26, heading off into uh, Kintail, you know, I knew... I was going to make it to Ben Hope. I was in a better pace, place mentally. Being a mountain athlete, doing most of my training in the Scottish Highlands, I'm well aware of how the climate change is impacting the Highlands of Scotland, especially in winter. I do a lot of ski touring in winter because it's much more fun ski touring than trying to run through waist deep snow. And over the last four or five years, there's been a big difference in the Scottish winters up in the Highlands. The, getting a lot milder and a lot wetter. Prime example was two years ago in February, top of Cairngorm was plus 10 degrees and the snow completely vanished. So, you know, there is, it is changing. And as a mountain athlete and someone that enjoys the mountains, I'm well aware that of my impact on the environment. So with that, recently myself and my wife, Rachel, we invested in a, an electric car, which is, great coming from Scotland like the Scottish government are doing great things for EV so we managed to get a interest-free loan and most of the charge points in Scotland are run by Charge Scotland which are virtually free as well so it's a great way of traveling also with that you know the stuff we're doing in the house like we're eating a bit less meat you know recycling a bit more and also being aware of our food waste you know the Highland Council do a great effort with the food waste and you know that's one of the biggest polluters as well as food waste so you know we're, we're as a couple and as an individual you know we're just trying to do our small bit for the environment and um, 
thank you for listening thank you for your time and hopefully see you out in the mountains at some point Hello, I'm Graham Neville of Nature Scott, and I'm going to be looking a little bit at the ecological side of the climate emergency and what role nature can play in providing nature based solutions to help us adapt and be resilient. So, as we all know, last year the First Minister declared a climate emergency, and Highland Council followed suit quite quickly, declaring a climate and ecological emergency, recognising the crisis also of biodiversity loss. We were warned that unless we take radical action, our natural world faces something of an apocalypse. Obviously in a world without COVID-19, the connected crisis of biodiversity loss and the climate emergency would still be at the top of the political agenda. Right now, recovery from the outbreak is rightfully at the center of political thinking. And, but we are at a point in time where a pivot towards ecological restoration and action and climate change is a critical plank of our green recovery to heal our nation and to secure a rich, a nature rich, zero carbon future for Scotland. We've all seen graphs like this, all too familiar with the increase in global surface temperatures. And this really does show us that we are in a state of climate emergency. Nature and biodiversity has been in a year on year decline for decades. We do need to take action and nature has a key role to play as play in helping us adapt to climate change and in offsetting or mitigating some of the impacts of it. And of course, I would say that as uh, representing the Scottish Government's Nature Conservation Agency, but this is not just about protecting nature for nature's sake, not because it's pretty or because it makes people happy, but whilst it does these things, it's, you know, it's about protecting nature to set, to provide a safe operating space for humanity. Recent trajectories of emissions is positive, um, but we do have a lot of work to do before we can get to net zero. Progress has been made in Scotland, but this is largely due to uh, the, the transition to renewables in the energy sector. Significantly harder challenges remain, such as reducing emissions from buildings and industry. Uh, main challenges are also around heat, uh, heat production, transport and uh, food and land use. The shutdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in reduced emissions, but this actually won't make much of a difference. The accumulating gas, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, temporary reduction will, will stop build-up, but won't uh, help these things to, uh, to reduce. So what's actually important isn't as brief lull in emissions. It's what we do when we come out. We need to make sure we have a green recovery. In effect, we need to ensure that our response to the COVID pandemic does not hinder our ability to respond to the crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. This, uh, this graph shows the, uh, the trajectory for global emissions. Uh, and as you'll see, in order to hit the one and a half to two degrees target, there needs to be a major reduction in global emissions from 2020 onwards. A major reduction would be about eight to 10% reduction for developed countries. There are very few signs, realistically no signs of this happening with the required urgency. Even if we reduce emissions drastically from today, we're still going to see big changes to our climate and to our lives due to the greenhouse gases already built up in our system. Emissions reduction on its own is essential, but will not be enough to create a safe place for, for people and nature in the future. So what does this mean for nature and what does it mean for nature in Highland? Well, catastrophic is a rather strong word, but we are seeing catastrophic impacts. And unfortunately, these are expected to increase in both frequency and severity. Just to take a, a sample of some of our habitats across the Highlands, the great rivers in Highland, of which characterised by the wide straths and the Cairngorms and the narrower gorges in the west, are often designated as internationally or nationally important wildlife sites they are seeing increased flashiness and storm events, which along with temperature rises are impacting iconic species. The bird life, the, the aquatic life that lives around them, freshwater uh, pearl mussels, Atlantic salmon are all affected by uh, rising water temperatures, as are the uh, communities affected by increased flood risk downstream. Last year, we saw some large scale fires and, and these are a symptom of drier springs and summers. Burning peatland emits an enormous amount of carbon, 
and the habitat it supports is fragile with some of our most vulnerable birds such as Curlew and Dunlin breeding in areas affected by for example the Melvich fire. Warmer summers also mean that species are either pushed to higher altitudes to find more comfortable acceptable habitats meaning the range becomes increasingly more fragmented or indeed they run out of altitudinal range. Sometimes the species will move north to achieve cooler climate and we're already seeing new species colonizing highland as a result of that but we also risk losing other species. And some of our seabirds such as the puffin here are struggling because the seasonality of their life cycle is becoming increasingly out of sync with important food source cycles meaning it's less food abundance when they're most in need for example when they're feeding their young. But we think that nature can play an incredibly valuable role in helping us be resilient in the face of the climate and ecological emergency. Nature-based solutions are ecosystem services, effectively ecosystems, whether they're natural or modified, that can provide multiple benefits in terms of carbon sequestration, biodiversity, benefits for human well-being, as well as making businesses more resilient, food production more sustainable, reducing flooding and buffering against shocks. This includes our woodlands, our peatlands, our rivers and wetlands all across highlands, provided they are healthy, as only if they're healthy can they offer their full potential. Nature-based solutions are cost effective. Globally, including all the tropical ecosystems, they're estimated to be capable of achieving approximately 30% of the emissions reductions needed for global net zero. The transformative effect of nature-based solutions in the landscape are generally cheaper than engineered solutions delivering multiple complementary benefits for society. And an example of this is in, shown in this slide, maintaining carbon or increasing the carbon stored in our landscape is a nature-based solution. We've made great progress in reducing carbon emissions, but what we must continue to do and must do more of is increasing the carbon which is stored in the environment. Our carbon-rich habitats in Highland store a significant amount of carbon. And you know, an example here is our, is our great peatlands and the, the image of the flow country behind me. There's significant effort to ensure that carbon store remains in place and increases. The store includes peatlands and woodlands, marine and coastal environments, and uncultivated and cultivated soils. If we look after this, if we store the carbon in this landscape, other benefits flow from maintaining and increasing this. Enhanced biodiversity, flood management, sustainable economic development and improved health and well-being. For example, woodland planting along river courses keeps the temperature of the water low, allowing freshwater pearl mussels and salmon to be uh, to, to thrive. We know that Scotland's peatland currently score, stores 7,000 metric tonnes of CO2 equivalent, but because around 70 to 90% of it across Scotland is not in good condition, our peat bogs emit nearly 10 metric tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year and will continue to be a net emitter unless they're restored. The Scottish Government has committed to investing over 250 million over the next 10 years for peatland restoration, and we've seen a significant proportion of that. Uh, of, of peatland restoration happening in Highland already. Sustainably managed forests are also important for reducing emissions. Whilst they store carbon in the landscape, the wood can be used sustainably for in construction, creating an additional stock of carbon in the built environment. And if it's used more close to where it's grown, a more circular economy can, can result. Scotland is actually one of the countries with the lowest woodland cover in Europe. Our semi-natural habitats need to be brought back in good condition to play their role in climate change mitigation too. Total emissions from agriculture and related land use are high, seven and a half metric tons of CO2 equivalent in 2018, which is a reduction from 9.7 in 2017, demonstrating the efforts of many, many farmers. But low carbon farming techniques, including improved soil health, are starting to show benefits. In our marine environment, uh, there are, there are significant amounts of economic uh, infrastructure protected by soft uh, nature-based uh, solutions. 
Uh, for example, 13 billion of built assets are protected behind natural defences such as sand dunes or salt marsh. And on the ocean floor, significant amounts of carbon are stored in sediments and habitats and, and creatures uh, such as uh, merrow, merrow beds and shells. We're working with Scottish Government uh, in a project called Dynamic Coast, which uh, is, is a tool that can help us to work out where the risks to these uh, soft uh, sedimentary coasts are and help nature to adapt to that. Nature Scott has a, a role as the leading body by, for promoting nature-based solutions to help us to respond to climate change in Scotland. We have some considerable expertise and knowledge in the current research management implementation and best practice and are working and are happy to work in partnerships as we are in Highland, thankfully through uh, things like the Highland Adapts project and, and, and many other networks across the area uh, to work at both a community and at a landscape scale. We believe that there are opportunities for multiple uses, multiple benefits from nature-based solutions. And we are keen to work with uh, people, work, meaningful co-design, meaningful co-production and, and management with lots of community engagement. And that's our vision, a real joint effort to help us to have a nature-rich future and meet our net zero targets. Thank you very much. Hi there, um, thanks very much for having me here today. Uh, I think this is probably the third or fourth time I've tried to record this properly um, onto the, the digital format, so hopefully um, hopefully this time it's worked okay. Um, my name is Bruce Wilson, I work for the Scottish Wildlife Trust, um, mainly on policy and political engagement, um, but across a whole range of things uh, across the organisation. Uh, as I say, um, thanks very much for, for, for having me uh, here today and really thanks for giving us the opportunity to, to talk about our nature recovery plan. Uh, the plan outlines 11 immediate high impact interventions to restore nature in Scotland. Uh, we think delivering these actions would support a more resilient economy, it'd help us achieve our ambitious climate change targets and provide wide ranging benefits for society which would basically contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals that Scotland's signed up to um, from the United Nations. It's really important that I say that we produced this report jointly with WWF Scotland and with RSPB Scotland. Uh, I hope that the kind of joint nature of this reflects how importantly we think this um, shared ambition is. And, and how much um, the three of our organisations think that it's, it's really imperative that we progress these actions immediately in Scotland. The idea behind this document came from one of the First Minister's assertions um, it, that, she, that she made in several places. Um, the example I've got on screen here is from a letter that she wrote to Scottish Environment Link. The assertion was that the challenges facing biodiversity are as important as the challenges of climate change um, and the First Minister wants Scotland to be leading the way in our response. You can see that on the um, on the paragraph, on uh, the third paragraph on the screen there. So really the three organisations, Scottish Wildlife Trust, WWF and RSPB Scotland, we thought, well, given that the, the government now sees the biodiversity crisis as as important as the climate crisis, what are the actions we can put forward right now um, that are uh, corresponding and complementary with climate action um, to, to really tackle this nature emergency. Um, and the result was this nature recovery plan. Uh, so we wrote the thing, um, got it all ready, warmed up all our contacts in government and across different agencies like uh, SNH, Nature Scott as they're known now, and SEPA and, and all sorts of partnership organisations that might be able to help support this document. And then, as we all know, COVID struck, hence why I'm speaking to you through a computer screen today and, and not in person. Uh, this basically um, turned the policy landscape on its head in Scotland. Nothing was a priority other than the immediate response to COVID, the, the health response. So for obvious reasons, we shelved the document. But then um, it quickly became apparent that we we're, we're kind of going to need to recover from this incredibly turbulent time for society and the economy and, and talk really turned to how we recover and rebuild. So 
the Scottish Government um, asked Benny Higgins um, and an influential group of economic and, and kind of um, business type advisors, including uh, Professor Georg Gear Helm, that's written extensively on natural capital, to, to outline what, how they thought we might meet a, a green recovery. And they produced this document towards a robust, resilient well-being economy for Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government responded with the Economic Recovery Implementation Plan. We were, were relatively happy that one of the sections um, in this, this document really, really highlighted um, the importance of investing in actions where the coincidence of emissions reduction, the development of natural capital and job creation were the strongest. Well, those, those themes are writ large throughout the Nature Recovery Plan. Um, we'd, we'd specifically written the Nature Recovery Plan with that in mind before the crisis. So, so actually, we're we're delighted that the document did did tally with the the stance that the Scottish Government were taking towards green recovery from COVID in Scotland. We did do a slight redraft to to bring those ideas even more to the fore, um, and we we made sure that all of the asks and actions in, in this document are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and time-based, the, the SMART acronym, so that they were as easy to write into policy as, as, as possible. Uh, and we've outlined the direct biodiversity benefit in each case, goes without saying, um, but we've also outlined the, um, the kind of societal and economic benefits uh, and how the, those relate to the, the national performance framework in Scotland. So onto these individual asks themselves. There's 11 of them, um, and the first being delivering a significant expansion in Scotland's native woodlands annually from 2020, introducing new legislation to achieve sustainable low impact fishing by the end of 2021, the implementation of licensing for driven grouse shooting by the end of 2021, and as I'm sure many people on this conference will know, we're anxiously awaiting the response to the Werity review into driven grouse manure uh, management. Um, so we hope the Scottish Government will be coming forward with further detail on that imminently. Um, reducing deer populations and maintaining them at sustainable levels through either new or improved legislation by the end of 2021. Um, after the Werity review, the Scottish Government needs to respond to the the um, review into deer management in Scotland. So we, we hope for, we're hoping for some further detail on this from the Scottish Government very soon as well. We want to ensure that all new development is net positive for nature and um, kind of biodiversity net gain principles through the National Planning Framework 4 in 2022. We want to include a Scottish nature network in National Planning Framework 4. And um, that's going to be in, again in, uh, in 2022 and with delivery focused um, for the end of, of 2030. We want to see an end on burning on peatland and commercial extraction and sale of peat for horticulture across Scotland by 2023. We'd like to introduce and apply new rules to improve the use of nitrogen by 2024. We want to see the establishment of a Scottish invasive non-native species inspectorate by 2025. We want to transform Scottish agricultural policy by 2027 so that it facilitates and rewards nature and climate friendly farming. We want to commit at least 30% of Scotland seas to being highly protected with at least 10% fully protected by 2030. Oh, and I realise I've put two tens and at the end there um, and not an 11 on the seal slide at the end. Uh, my apologies for that. So those, um, they're not in any kind of order. Those are 11 priority actions we want to see happen right now. We just numbered them for, for ease of reference really throughout the document. Um, I think there'll be uh, a link to the document included within the, the kind of conference pack that you'd be provided with. So please do click through the, the document in your leisure and, and, and look through them. Quite often asked by people, what are the actions that they can take as an individual? Well, we've got an election coming up in Scotland um, scarily fast. <laughs> I would encourage you if you have anyone coming around to your doorstep, maybe a bit unlikely in the current situation, but if there's online hosting events or you have the opportunity to ask um, potential MSPs or your current MSPs 
around what they're doing for nature, reference this document, talk to them about the, the, the kind of questions that are raised by it, and um, it will help get it up the political agenda. That's that's the thing that really makes um, makes things happen on the ground and, and results in action. So I would I would urge people to do that. Um, I'm not really meant to have a sort of um, a favourite of these 11 asks, but personally, I really would like to see greater action on the Scottish Nature Network. It's about providing greater coordination for what we do on the ground for biodiversity and, and uh, species management and where we put the green and green, green and blue infrastructure on the landscape. I think without having that strategic um, thinking, we're really not going to meet our biodiversity or climate targets in Scotland. I think it's quite essential that we get on with that immediately. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Good morning, everyone. And it's really nice to be able to join you for your conference. I'm really sorry that I, we're not having it in person, um, as I say, and so we can have this discussion face to face. But I'm really happy to be with you to talk about agriculture and climate change and the role that agriculture has in terms of helping us actually meet the requirements that we have in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving soil carbon sequestration and improving the profitability and resilience of farming systems. So I work for an organisation called the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit. And one of the things that we do, our main aim, we're farmer led. Uh, we've been going for about 11 years now. And the main reason why we exist is to really try and encourage and support farmers and growers with practical tools and resources which can help them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, improve their farm em energy resilience and their soil health. And in doing so, really improve their farm business in the future because really what we're focusing on when we're looking at farming uh, and adapting our farming practices to help reduce emissions and improve sequestration is really looking at those opportunities that we have to be able to start to improve farm business resilience and that's really where we're coming from. So if we start then and we look at actually well well what's going on with greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture? And although a lot of the discussions uh, when we start talking about climate change and carbon is very much focused on carbon, you can see from this pie chart here that for agriculture, carbon is only a small percentage of the issue. It's only producing about 10% of um, agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions. The vast majority of emissions from agriculture are coming from nitrous oxide and from methane. And overall, if you look at all the different activities that are happening within the UK, agriculture is responsible for about 10% of our emissions. Now, this has already provided us with a little bit of complication in the fact that we're not just dealing with one gas, we're dealing with three gases. But we actually have a really good opportunity here because carbon management and managing carbon on the farm and efficiency and business efficiency and resource use efficiency are really, really closely linked. So there are really, really good things that farmers can do that not only cut their greenhouse gas emissions, but also improve their business efficiency. And these are the things that we're helping farmers to focus on first. However, we also have to remember that apart from the fact that we're just dealing with three gases, we're also dealing with a really diverse nature of farming businesses. And as such, there isn't one magic solution or one golden bullet that's going to sort all of the emissions associated with agriculture out. We have to work with, it, with individual farmers and start to understand what's driving their business and combine that with the latest science and research to be able to really develop solutions that work across our industry. It's also really important to remember that we're not just producing these emissions for the sake of producing these emissions. These emissions are coming as, as a result of our farmers producing food which help to feed the nation. And as such, we need to sort of look at them within that context. They're also difficult to measure. As I said, we're not just dealing with one gas, we're dealing with three gases. And these gases are being produced within an evolving biological system. So as which is dependent on the weather, climatic conditions and management practices. So it can be quite tricky to understand what's happening in terms of where these gases are coming from. And also it's dependent on the weather. So if we have winters which are very, very full of rain, um, then actually our soils are producing nitrous oxide irrespective of what we do on top of them. So these are the things that we need to look at. Agriculture is a leaky system. As I say, there will be emissions coming from our landscapes even if we're not doing anything on top of them. So we're never going to be able to get rid of all of our emissions. 
if we look here, we can start to see, you know, how, where the different areas in terms of emissions are coming from. And you'll also start to see why there's been quite a lot of focus on agriculture over the last few years. Agriculture in that graph is that line in green. And you can see that since about 2009, we've not really managed to achieve any more drastic emissions reductions in agriculture. And that's one of the reasons why agriculture is being focused on as one of the industries that needs to really start looking at how we can decarbonize. And farmers are very much up for this challenge. If we look at the reasons why we should manage carbon on farm, well, there's lots and lots of policy drivers and legislation. We started with the sort of Climate Change Act back in 2009, which was our first you know, opportunity to start to look at how we could put those emissions reductions into legislation. And obviously, since July last year, we've now got net zero legislation, which is saying that by 2050, we need to have reduced all of our emissions to zero. And then within the farming industry, we've also got an, um, an aspiration to actually reach net zero by 2040. So there's a lot of policy drivers and legislation that's pushing all of this into the direction to really, really reduce emissions. But if we look at an individual farm situation and why an individual farmer might want to reduce their emissions well it makes business sense as i said at the beginning there's lots and lots of um, work that's shown that there's a really good relationship between cutting emissions and actually improving business profitability so it's a really really good opportunity for a farmer to start to look at his business through another lens it also allows farmers to be more informed and make better decisions so when they're looking at those things that they might be wanting to do within their business you can actually evaluate those from a carbon perspective as well as an economic and a practical one it enables a positive narratives farmers are doing stuff to reduce their emissions. Farmers are up for the challenge and farmers want to be involved. And so by providing that data and understanding of what's going on on farm, we can start to help provide a positive, in, positive narrative that, of, that documents the efforts that our industry is making. It helps create more resilient businesses and it helps to future-proof them to allow us to prosper in the future. So if we look at it then, where are those emissions coming from? So we have three those three gases. We have nitrous oxide, which comes from soils, manures and fertilizers. We have methane, which is coming from our ruminant livestock. And that's when those ruminant livestock are breaking down the things that we can't eat in terms of forage and they're turning it into things that we can. And then we also have carbon dioxide, which like a lot of other industries is coming from the burning of fossil fuels. If we look at our live, our arable farms or our crop based farms, the vast majority of emissions on those farms is coming from fertilizer, both in terms of its production and also its application. About 20 percent of emissions on an arable farm are coming from fuel use. So how those how those crops are being sown, the diesel that's used to drive those tractors and field operations. So cultivation that's happening in the field. About 10 percent is happening is coming from uh, fertili other fertilizers in terms of phosphate and potash fertilizer, the use of manures and lime. Just under 10% is coming from sown seeds, so from taking that seed to the field to plant it, and a small amount of that is coming from crop protection. If we look on a ruminant livestock farm, so those farms that are producing uh, meat or milk in terms of beef and lamb or milk, then about half of those emissions are coming from the animals themselves, as I say, in terms of that process by which our ruminant animals break down grass and turn it into meat or milk. About 20% is coming from manures, um, about 10% from fertiliser, 10% from feed that's coming onto the farm to feed those stock and about Tessa from power and fuel. So these are all areas where we can focus our management to start to reduce emissions and help you know, make that business more profitable. But what I haven't touched on so far is this unique option that we have within our agricultural industry to not only uh, you know, look at reducing our emissions, but also to provide one of the solutions to climate change. We are unique in our ability within agriculture to be able to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it on farm, either in our trees, in our hedgerows, in other woody biomass or within our soils. And this is something that we really need to focus on as we move forward and we look at how we can actually start to address the issues that we have around reducing emissions and achieving net zero. Being able to harness the power that agriculture gives us in terms of being able to provide the sequestration solution is really, really important. And if we focus for a minute on trees, there's been a lot of attention on the sequestration potential from trees. And don't get me wrong, trees are really, really important. They are one of the tools within our armory in terms of being able to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And trees can also have another fantastic benefits in terms of helping with natural flood management, in terms of providing habitat, which encourages biodiversity and other bits as well. 
Within farms, we also have the ability to utilize our on-farm hedgerows and the way that we're managing those hedgerows to make sure that we are maximizing the sequestration potential that those hedgerows have by letting them grow wider and taller and not cutting them as frequently. We're able to add additional carbon sequestration without actually having to do anything massively difficult. However, as well as the opportunities that we have within our woody biomass, one of the biggest opportunities that we have is our soils. Soils are one of the biggest stores of carbon that we have currently. And actually what we can do on top of those as farmers is we can start to help maximize the ability of our soils to improve their soil health and their condition. And at the same time, allow more carbon to come through our plants and be stored in our soils. And there's lots of really exciting work going on at the moment to really start to be able to look at the opportunities and quantify the amount of carbon that we're able to hold by adapting our management practice. So that's just been a bit of a, a whistle stop tour through some of the exciting things that are happening within agriculture at the moment. It's really important to remember that farmers and farming businesses are at the front line of climate change and they're one of the industries that are impacted most severely by these changing weather patterns that we're getting. But we also are one of the only industries that offer a solution. So there's really good opportunities to not just reduce emissions, but look at where we can really work with farmers to start to optimise the amount of carbon that we can store within our landscapes. And by allowing farmers to start to look at where they can start to put these management practices in place and they can document the benefits of this, it allows us to really start to change the conversation and provide it in a really positive way so that we can start to show the efforts that our farmers are taking in terms of trying to address the climate crisis that we're in at the moment. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Forestry plays an important role in our ability to adapt to climate change to become more sustainable and to prevent further biodiversity loss. Did you know that one way of meeting Scotland's net zero greenhouse gas emissions target by 2045 was by planting trees? This is because trees can absorb atmospheric CO2 as they grow. They also provide a source of wood fuel and support our biomass energy industry. They also offer an alternative source of material which can replace more carbon intensive materials. This graph shows the historical greenhouse gas emissions and sequestration from rural land use in Scotland from 1990 to 2008. It has also included a business as usual emissions projection to 2022, which assumes that no intervention will be taken to reduce our emissions. As you can see from the graph, the amount of carbon sequestration from woodland in Scotland has increased since 1990. However, Crown 2011 have indicated that the amount of CO2 sequestered peaked around 2004. Here they have explained that this is due to the lower levels of woodland creation in Scotland during the 1990s. As many Scottish forests have now reached maturity, they sequester CO2 more slowly than younger forests. Evidently, forestry can play a key role in our ability to adapt to climate change. However, it is critical that when we plant trees, we adhere to the sustainable concept of the right tree in the right place for the right purpose, as is outlined in the Scottish Forestry Strategy 2019 to 2029. By incorporating this thinking into forest management, we can ensure that forestry in Scotland continues to provide a wide and expanding range of environmental, social and economic benefits, both now and in the future. On paper, the concept of achieving sustainable forest management appears simple. However, it must be appreciated that the actual application is a challenging task to accomplish. This is because of the complexities presented to forest managers and planners to achieve a balance between the environmental, social and economic components of forestry. In this presentation, I plan to take you on a journey of the history of forestry in Scotland with the intention of exploring some of the current issues it faces today. And I hope to leave you with a greater appreciation and understanding of the role forests and their consequent management play in the big picture. My name is Deborah Halliday and I'm here today to share my passion and enthusiasm about forestry and the environment. I'm a geography graduate from the University of the Highlands and Islands and I'm currently studying forestry at the Scottish School of Forestry so that I can enhance my understanding of land and forest management. 
Currently, I'm undertaking a supervisory student placement with Forestry and Land Scotland, otherwise known as FLS. During my year with FLS, I will be working on enhancing my understanding of the role that governmental policies and legislation play in the achievement of delivering sustainable forest management. FLS was founded as a new executive agency of the Scottish Government in April 2019 after the passing of the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Act 2018. This means that FLS is responsible for managing and taking care of Scotland's national forest and land, an area sought to cover roughly 9% of Scotland's entire land area. FLS's vision is to provide forests and land that Scotland can be proud of. Before I continue, I would like to make clear that the information in this presentation does not reflect the views or opinions of Forestry and Land Scotland. I would now like to provide a brief background into forestry in Scotland. Scots pine and birches once covered the Scottish Highlands. This forest was otherwise known as the Caledonian Forest. Looking back 6,000 years, this native woodland would have been the principal vegetation type. Yet today, it's only believed to constitute 4% of forest cover. Whilst this loss can be attributed to the onset of poor climatic conditions around 4,000 years ago, anthropogenic deforestation is believed to have contributed significantly to its demise. The extent of devastation caused by the loss of this Caledonian habitat over recent millennia has led Sandum et al. 2013 to describe the Scottish Highlands as an ecologically degraded landscape. So, how have humans contributed to the loss of our native woodland? A study by Robbins and Fraser 2003 has mentioned how changes in the political economy of the highlands as exhibited by the transition from cattle to sheep rearing and then later to deer stocking have influenced this demise in forest cover. According to a paper by Summers et al 2008, by the 20th century the original pine woodland had been fragmented into small sections which continued to be exploited to differing levels for the purpose of timber production, firewood and grazing whilst other sections became part of sporting estates which promoted large numbers of red deer, preventing successful regeneration. During wartime periods, these woodland resources were further depleted as more timber was required for shipbuilding and fuel. In fact, by the time World War I ended, it was estimated that only 5% of Scotland's forest coverage remained. This issue of deforestation remained unchanged until the government introduced an afforestation policy after the First World War to support forestry and establish it as a strategic timber reserve. However, as this policy was largely focused on increasing our tree coverage by promoting exotic conifers, exotic conifer planting has, until recently, dominated our woodland and forest expansion. In the 1900s, the objective was to attain and sustain a large and repeatable crop of timber. As a result, efforts were focused on growing forests, which would produce the greatest amount possible of whatever crop or service that offered the most benefit and keep growing it for generation after generation. The omission of the well-being of the environment in this outlook was an unfortunate oversight, which would only be realised nearly a century later due to the negative fallout that arose from the clear felling of native woodlands to make way for more productive crops such as Sitka spruce. However, over the second half of the 20th century, Scotland acknowledged that this industrial and intensive forest practice that had dominated from the 1960s to early 1980s was not acceptable, and it began to recognise the importance of including environmental and wider society interests in its approach. The 1990s were a key turning point in marking forestry policy change in Scotland, which reflected sustainability issues raised at the first Earth Summit in 1992. As a result, we now have documents like the UK Forestry Standard and Scotland's Forestry Strategy 2019 to 2029 to guide us on the right path with additional certification being available from the UK Woodland Assurance Standard to verify our woodlands are being sustainably managed. In addition to this, the negative impact that Sitka spruce has on changing our drainage systems, altering our ancient cultural landscape and preventing the development of native ground vegetation has now been recognised. Efforts are now being made to restore plantations on ancient woodland sites, and we are now conserving the remaining remnants of our ancient native woodlands. Now, let's move on to the white elephant in the room, climate change. 
It is widely accepted that global climate change is occurring due to human activity. One of the principal challenges facing decisions concerning environmental management adaption is a general lack of certainty regarding what impact climate change will have on our ecosystem services. Climate models have predicted a rise in the risk of more extreme climatic events, increasing the frequency of forest fires and the occurrence of wind blow. It is further expected that it will impact on the suitability and distribution of most species in Scotland, was it anticipated that the likelihood of increased drought in eastern Scotland will make conditions unfavourable for growing Sitka spruce, Scotland's main timber crop. In addition to this, milder winters are anticipated to increase the number of outbreaks of pests and diseases. Compounding this is the prediction of increased browsing from deer as its population is anticipated to increase as a result of milder winters. Whilst the effect of past forest management has undeniably resulted in habitat loss and fragmentation, it is also important to recognise that the decision to increase our tree coverage using exotic conifers occurred after a devastating world war and governmental focus was on establishing a strategic resource. Additionally, there was limited environmental understanding until the early 1970s when the first studies began to emerge addressing environmental issues. It has now been acknowledged that this trend of exotic conifer planting needs to change in order to prevent native habitat loss and to improve our forest resilience to climate change. Compared to past generations, we have the benefit of both hindsight and improved environmental understanding, which makes it easy for us to look at this as a failing of the generations that went before. However, I would argue it is a lesson that we must all learn from to progress and prosper. Because of this lesson, we now consider environmental, social and economic components as being integral and equally important in the achievement of sustainable forest management. The world needs us, all of us, now more than ever before, to make the right choice and do what needs to be done to save our planet. Let our legacy not stop with our own extinction, but that of one where we can be proud to say we left nothing but footprints. Thank you for listening to my talk. Hi everyone, my name is Roxanne Anderson. I'm a peatland scientist. I work for the Environmental Research Institute in Tharsal, in part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. I'm here today for the Highland Climate Change Conference to talk to you about peatland and the role that they might play in our race to reach net zero by 2045. What are peatlands? Well, peatlands are area that have at least 30 centimetres of peat. And what is peat? Well, peat is dead plants, organic matter formed by plant that is not fully decomposed over time. Peat forms usually where the, the conditions are difficult for microbes to decompose the organic matter. And that might be because it's very wet or cold, or because the, the plant's uh, organic matter is very difficult to degrade for the microbes themselves. Peatlands can form and accumulate peat over thousands and thousands of years if left alone, and most of the biomass and most of the carbon is therefore buried underground. We do have a lot of peatlands in the highlands, but there's also lots of other types of peatlands all around the world. There are peatlands in the northern hemisphere, but there's also peatland in the tropics that are very different in nature and character. The peatlands in the northern hemisphere, called northern peatlands, store approximately 450 to 600 gigatons of carbon. That's an awful lot of carbon, and that's only in 3% of the land. So all of that carbon, which is equivalent to the amount of carbon that's currently in the atmosphere around the planet, makes peatland the most efficient ecosystem for storing carbon on the planet, uh, terrestrial ecosystem on the planet. In the UK, we do have a lot of peatland. We have 2.6 million hectares of peatland approximately, which puts us in the top 10 countries in the world for peatland area. And importantly, a lot of those uh, peatland, 2.2 million hectares, are one particular type of, of peatland that are called blanket bog. Blanket bog can only form in hyperoceanic climate under high latitude, so often in coastal uh, or island location, 
In the UK, it has approximately 13% of the world's blanket bog and therefore has a very big responsibility in terms of the conservation and management of this globally rare biome. And in particular, in the highlands, we have the flow country. The flow country, which is approximately 4,000 kilometers square, is the largest blanket bog in Europe, possibly in the world, and because of its global significance, is now a candidate for UNESCO World Heritage Site. So much like in the rest of the world, in the UK, peatlands have been degraded for a long time by uh, human activities and here uh, in the UK, we have approximately 80% of our peatland have been damaged to some degree. Whilst there are still some peatlands in what we call near natural condition, the vast majority of peatlands bear imprints of human impact, whether it's drainage, erosion or burning, afforestation or, or even pollution. And that is quite significant because when peatlands are not disturbed, when peatlands are in their near natural state, what they do is they cut carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis and release a little bit of that carbon in the aquatic pathway or in the form of methane. But overall, they're what we call net carbon sink and net greenhouse gas sinks as well. However, when peatlands are degraded, when we remove those barrier for decomposition, all of the carbon that's been accumulated over thousands and thousands of years becomes available for microbes to degrade more quickly and is released back into the atmosphere as CO2. And therefore, peatlands, when they are degraded, instead of being net carbon sink, they become net carbon source. And instead of being net cooling for the climate over long periods of time, they become net fueling or net, they, they, they fuel climate change, if you like, that they contribute to heating uh, the, the, the climate even more. In the UK, this is quite significant because we have such a large area of degraded peatland. In fact, all the emissions from degraded peatland in the UK contribute to approximately 20 million tonnes of carbon dioxide uh, per year. And that's more or less 4% of the total emission, greenhouse gas emission from all sectors in the UK uh, total. So it, it is a huge number. It's, it's very big. And most of these emissions come from uh, peatlands that have been converted to agriculture, um, intensive grassland and forestry. So the, these are the, the, the worst emitters from the peatland sector, the graded peatland sector, if you like. And although in the highlands we do have large areas that are still intact, we also have areas that have been degraded by afforestation from non-native conifer plantations in the 70s and 80s. And a lot of areas have also been impacted by agriculture drains uh, or, or grits. And, and all of those contribute to, to greenhouse gas emission. But the degradation of peatland is also bad news in terms of uh, in, for, for another reason. We know that with climate change, there is an increased incidence of drought and that those droughts uh, are, are associated with the condition that lead to an increase in, in likelihood of wildfire. And we know also that degraded peatland are much more vulnerable to catastrophic fires, and that's simply because they're much drier than near natural peatland, and also because they support slightly different vegetation types that are more susceptible to, to fire. In 2019, there was one very big fire in the north of the highlands and near Strathy that burned approximately 5,400 5, hectares of peatlands um, in a range of under a range of different land uses. And it's estimated that that single fire led to um, as much or released as much carbon as the whole of Scotland for between eight to 10 days. So degraded peatlands are emitting carbon, but degraded peatland on fire are an absolute nightmare in terms of carbon emissions. And beyond carbon, we peatland in near natural condition are host to unique and highly adapted uh, species and they are vulnerable to degradation. And as well as the climate crisis, there is currently a biodiversity crisis where a lot of the species around the world are in decline and much of this decline is associated with land use change um, of which peatland degradation is only an example. That brings us to why peatland restoration matters. So peatland restoration matters because it can um, change, uh, it can change these numbers. Basically, 
When we do peatland restoration, what we try to achieve is to bring back those barriers to decomposition that reduce the, the emission of the carbon, basically make sure that the carbon that's in the ground stays in the ground as much as possible. Um, by reducing the emission from degraded peatland, we achieve what is called avoided losses or climate mitigation through avoided loss. Over time, many of the restored peatland are likely to be able to return to a sequestering ecosystem. And in that case, as well as avoided loss, we'll also have gains from peatland restoration through net carbon, net greenhouse gas sequestration. And we also know that peatland restoration has, is, is helping to reduce the, in the fire severity by bringing back those really wet conditions and therefore it might help in the long-term resilience, but also to avoid these very large um, emission associated with catastrophic wildfires. To try to put some numbers onto that, we, in 2019, we decided to do an exercise where we would calculate the carbon footprint of the Highland Estate, the Welbeck Estate, um, and we would compare the emission from the land use sector and from some of the operational business activities to have an idea of of how they, how they compare. Much of the estate is covered by peatlands in some form or other, includes a lot of near natural peatlands, but also some drain modified bog and some restoration of uh, so areas that have had some restoration through drain blocking and reprofiling. And what we found when we compared the emissions from all of the land users and from the business sector is that basically, the business sector or the business activities that we mapped don't really matter in the grand scheme of things because they contribute less than 3% uh, emission for, from the total of the emissions. Most of the emission from that estate were coming from land users and most of the emission from the land users were coming from drain peatland. And so we looked at what uh, cut peatland restoration would mean in terms of emission savings and we estimated that so far the restoration of just over a thousand hectares of peatland had offset the equivalent of 40, 463 uh, people's annual emission and that if all of the rest of the peatland that could be restored were restored that would contribute to further offsetting the equivalent of 760 people's annual emission. Altogether we estimated that if all the restored area uh, all the areas were restored. The, the difference between the degraded peatland and the restored area would be equivalent to 80 years of the entire estate's fleet of vehicle emission. In other words, we think that peatland restoration and associated sustainable, sustainable land uses are by far the best strategy for a large highland estate to contribute to emission reduction towards net zero. Importantly, there are financing available options available through, for example, the peatland, um, code or the Peatland Action Programme, which is uh, Nature Scott, which is managed by Nature Scott on behalf of Scottish Government. So we we think that there is no reason why peatland restoration uh, cannot happen, and there is absolutely no right reason why it should not happen now because we think that there is a very strong argument uh, for peatland restoration to be taken up as one of the key strategies, especially in the Highlands for reaching net zero by 2045. Of course, this will go along with a range of other strategies, um, but it's clear that if we don't restore our peatlands and if we don't restore them as soon as possible, um, it's only going to become more difficult in the future to avoid those very large emis um, emission associated with them. So I'd just like to finish by thanking everybody uh, who has contributed to to the work that we do uh, up here in the ERI and in particular to thank the people that have contributed to the carbon footprint study that's Anson and Alexa McCoslin, Pia Tapp and Magnus Davidson. I hope that the presentation was informative and if you have any questions feel free to email me or get in touch with me uh, over Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to make today's keynote speech. This virtual experience is a reminder of the current challenging circumstances. The COVID-19 pandemic has and continues to have tragic and wide-reaching effects, and our response is ongoing. But while the world continues to grapple with coronavirus, the climate emergency has not gone away, far from it. And our commitment to a just transition to net zero emissions by 2045 remains absolute. While no aspect of the pandemic is to be celebrated, 
the positive behavioural changes we have seen and the necessity for an economic recovery has presented an opportunity. It is essential that we learn lessons from our experience of lockdown to redesign our economy and society and to deliver a greener, more sustainable Scotland through a green recovery. Scotland has a vision of a green recovery where we capture both the opportunities of delivering economic, social and environmental well-being and responding to climate change and biodiversity loss. Progressing our pathway to net zero while creating good jobs will be the core objective of a just and green recovery from COVID-19. We're already taking action. A green recovery and a drive to create good green jobs was central to our recent programme for government. This included a groundbreaking £1.6 billion investment in tackling emissions in Scotland's buildings. This will create jobs, reduce emissions and mitigate poor energy efficiency as a driver of fuel poverty. We also committed to a £100 million green jobs fund to help businesses providing low carbon products to grow and create jobs. We're also scaling up peatland restoration and tree planting, helping to mitigate climate change and biodiversity loss, and at the same time creating jobs in the Highlands and throughout Scotland. I noted your announcement in June that Highland Council recognises the importance of a green recovery, and I look forward to working with you on that. We recognise that the Highlands face unique realities when it comes to adapting to the impacts of climate change, including remoteness and challenges caused by disruptions to key infrastructure that communities depend on for critical services. Scotland's adaptation programme recognises these challenges and aims to build the resilience of infrastructure networks. Equally, however, Highland communities are uniquely placed to reap the benefits of the transition to net zero. The Highlands geography and land assets provide opportunities, including in renewable energy development, nature-based solutions and natural capital. I was impressed to learn that Highlands Council and partner organisations are establishing a Highlands Adapts initiative, and I look forward to seeing that as it rolls out. Such regional partnerships can greatly complement our support for national action on adaptation and resilience, such as the additional £150 million for flood risk management announced in the programme for government. We are acutely aware that public bodies are at the front line of Scotland's climate emergency response. I can assure you that we are committed to working closely with local government to facilitate high ambition in tackling the climate emergency, in pursuing a green recovery and in adapting to the impacts of climate change. Good morning. Um, first of all, I wish to give my thanks to my colleague Joe for doing such an excellent job in pulling together today's conference, which I'm sure you'll all agree is both timely and necessary. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Keith Masson and I've been leading on climate change for the Highland Council for the past four years and working in the wider team for around seven. Now, I only have 10 minutes uh, for this presentation. There's way too much to cover off in the time allowed. So I'm hoping that at the very least, my presentation today will lead to further interaction and collaboration with many of you over the coming weeks and months. So in no small way, one of the reasons we're here today is because back in spring 2019, the Council recognised the increasing threat posed by climate change and declared a climate and ecological emergency. Now, a number of commitments were made as part of that declaration, but the key commitment on this slide is number two. Some of you will have been around long enough to remember that the original Carbon Clever vision was for a carbon neutral Inverness and a low carbon Highlands by 2025, and members of the Council have now recommitted to achieving that target. However, for the avoidance of any doubt, this is an area wide regional target rather than a corporate target just for the Highland Council. Now, clearly, in order to meet an area wide target such as the one committed to by the Council, we need to know what our baseline level of emissions is. So to that end, we've just about completed a greenhouse gas inventory report for the whole region, which will be the first such document produced for Highland and will give us a breakdown of emissions sources and sinks for the year 2018. Now, this is a critical piece of work to enable the Council to make evidence based and informed policy decisions and directly supports the programme alignment work which we're undertaking, which I'll discuss shortly. But in terms of this slide, the key point to note is the sequestration potential of the region through both forestry and peatland and the contribution that new onshore and offshore winds will make to the continued reduction in carbon intensity of electricity for the whole of the UK. There's a growing feeling that Highland as a region needs special status in this regard to reflect the disproportionate contribution that we will be making to Scotland's net zero ambition over the coming years. 
Now, in terms of our own corporate emissions performance at the Council, we've seen a clear downward trend in emissions over the lifetime of our current carbon management plan, which actually runs out in 2020. And this has been a result of council action on each of the areas scoped into the carbon management plan, such as energy, transport, fleet, um, waste, water, etc., but also the decarbonisation of the electricity grid. However, we do need to accept a couple of fundamental realities. Firstly, the council's own carbon footprint only accounts for between 2 and 3% of the region's total footprint. And secondly, the majority of our quick wins have now been taken reducing the remaining 40,000 tonnes of carbon from our own estate, which is emitted annually, is going to require a fundamental shift in how we deliver services and much better partnership and project work across the board. However, the need for a positive economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic provides a real opportunity to tackle this head on and expedite a lot of the work which we were going to need to have to do anyway. Now, this slide demonstrates the Council's biggest problem from my perspective and a problem which I'm sure will resonate with many of our conference attendees today, and that is the static consumption of electricity. Now, whilst we'll eventually eradicate our use of oil and gas by shifting those types of boilers over to alternatives, how we realistically start making some headway in reducing our electricity consumption is proving to be a big problem, especially given that our estate encompasses 1,200 non-domestic buildings. We've got a staff of 10,000 across the region the size of Belgium, and grid capacity issues limit our ability to deploy renewables at a number of our key sites. So there are a number of clear challenges ahead in terms of meeting any net zero ambition. But what are we currently doing? This slide gives a brief summary of some of the key work streams currently underway, and I'll focus a couple on a couple of these uh, for the remainder of the presentation. I'll not say too much about programme alignment just now, as I'll discuss that in more detail later. But in terms of energy, the Council is currently managing the largest SALEX fund for local authority in the whole of the UK. And this fund is predicated on achieving carbon emissions and cost savings. And the really useful and, and fantastic thing about it is that 75% of the savings that we achieve are recycled to allow us to undertake further decarbonisation work. Over and above that, we have an ongoing programme of solar PV installations, uh, both roof and ground mounted across our estate, as well as low carbon heating upgrades. And from my perspective, one of the most important pieces of work at the moment is Highland Adapt. We know that even if Scotland and Highland meets emissions reduction targets, there's a significant degree of change already locked into the climate system. It's therefore essential that we begin to properly prepare for this, and we're going to do that through Highland Adapts, which is a place-based partnership approach to adaptation which will be very much rooted in the needs of individual communities to help us develop an action plan which will allow the public sector to continue to deliver services throughout increasingly extreme weather events, but also increase the resilience of our communities. So I'd now like to talk briefly about our programme alignment work. Back in February 2020, we commissioned uh, the Sustainable Scotland Network and Practically Green to examine the three key strands on the slide, focused in on how these could better match the ambition set out in the Scottish Government's programme for government. Uh, and they were basically tasked with providing us with a report which sets out some key actions which we can undertake both internally and with partners to put ourselves in a better position to attract funding for low carbon projects. Now, a critical aspect of the, the work is around the natural asset base of the Highland region and how we as a council can better utilise not just our own estate for carbon sequestration, but how we can better work with partners to expedite projects which are going to help deliver a net zero region much quicker. Now, the work has and will continue to identify some of the key structural challenges which we need to address organisationally before we can realistically start to think about making more attractive funding bids. Um, from my own personal perspective, one of the best outcomes of this piece of work is that it provides an arm's length appraisal of where we are as a council, highlighting what we're doing well, but also where there's significant room for improvement. And that will give us a better opportunity to make the changes we need to become a true low carbon leader within Highland. So I've nearly covered off most of what I want to say. There are just a couple more slides to go. But as I mentioned earlier, we now have our net zero target to achieve, coupled with a, a fairly bleak financial situation for the public sector. Despite there being a range of, of really good projects and initiatives underway at the moment, we now have to get creative and really focus in on the opportunities that are out there. We know from speaking with key contacts that serious money is going to be made available in the near future. Now, the issues stated on the slide are informed by our work to date speaking to funders, speaking to officers, speaking to elected members. And these are issues that we think we can remedy in two ways. 
firstly by better aligning our programme, our policies and our projects with the Scottish Government, which I've discussed already, but secondly by developing what we're calling strategic control plans. The real challenge for us is improving our track record of delivery and our reputation, which are effectively two sides of the same coin, and we know that that's going to take some time and some political support. So alongside the programme alignment work, we've built up a picture of what is and isn't working and what needs to change. And really, this is about applying structure and control to our internal processes. And we're treating this as three bits of interdependent work by looking at the problem from end to end. First of all, setting out a vision for climate action is absolutely essential. Not having had a, a really robust vision previously to help guide works and funding bids has hindered us significantly. And we know that from feedback from funders. Uh, by agreeing and finalising a vision, we will have a point of reference. We'll have something to substantiate our proposals and our bids. Secondly, establishing appropriate project and funding governance is key in implementing the vision and ensuring that we deliver on our promises. We need this to weed out the speculative and ensure that the limited resource available to us focuses on work that aligns with our vision. In short, we can't afford to waste time on projects that aren't going to deliver. And thirdly, is about improving our funding bids and better understanding what's out there and how we can best access it. We know that speculative and rushed bids get us little reward, so we need to build up project initiatives and ideas that allow us to be proactive rather than reactive. If we look at the work we're currently doing in terms of delivering EV charging infrastructure throughout the region, for example, our team's strong relationship with funders means that we're in a position to inform funding calls and be clear on what we want, need and expect. So in terms of this slide, on the left is an output from a workshop we had with officers early in the summer. And this is laying out the foundation for this approach, the strategic control plan approach, and is really about applying some structure um, to, to help us agree on what we can or can't do. We're looking to find the right balance at the council between ambition and pragmatism. And the points in bold in this slide are really important as these are the principles um, we're really trying to implement into our new ways of working. And it's important to reiterate that while this piece of work is currently focused predominantly on enabling the electrification of vehicles, we view this as a transferable piece of work that could be replicated across the whole climate change agenda, but most importantly in respect of energy. So that's been a whistle stop tour of some of what we're up to. However, you can keep up to date with the work underway by the, at the Council by reading the papers which are presented to our climate change working group every six weeks. And I'll add a link um, to those papers into the chat. And finally, from me, I'm really looking forward to interacting with as many of you as possible at this afternoon's Bigger Picture workshop and hopefully see uh, quite a few of you there. Thank you very much. Hello, my name's Anna and my presentation is about adapting to climate change. I'm going to briefly introduce you to the Adaptation Scotland programme. We'll then move on to touching around on some facts around how Scotland's climate is changing and how it's projected to change in the years ahead. We'll then look at some climate change impacts that are affecting people in the Highlands and finally touch quickly upon the Highland ADAPTS initiative. So Adaptation Scotland is a programme that's funded by the Scottish Government and delivered by a sustainability charity called Sniffer. We enable organisations, businesses and communities in Scotland to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So how is Scotland's climate changing? This graph here shows you mean annual temperature change over the last century for the north of Scotland. You can see that over the course of the century, there's been a huge range of variation between individual years. Some years have been warmer than average, some years have been colder than average. But what we're really interested when it comes to long term climate change trends is understanding the average, the long term average. And that's shown by the black and grey line running through the centre of this graph. What that shows us is that we are seeing a consistent trend um, and a significant long-term average increase in temperatures for the north of Scotland, particularly from the 1960s onwards, where we've seen about 0.7 of a degree increase in temperature between the 1960s and the present day. We're also seeing significant increases in, in winter rainfall in the north of Scotland, as shown by this graph here. 
again, there's a lot of interannual variability. Some years when it's been actually much drier than average, some years when it's been a lot wetter than average. And it's absolutely normal to have that variation over those very short time scales. But when we're talking about climate change, we're looking for the long term average trends. And again, the black line through the centre of this graph shows us that trend. And we can very clearly see from the 1960s onwards that upward trend, that increase in winter rainfall for the north of Scotland, where we've seen rainfall increase um, by over 20 percent over that period from the 1960s onwards to present day. And these are just a couple of examples of the changes in climate that we've observed um, as occurring in the north of Scotland. And they're very much representative of changes that we've seen in Scotland's wider climate, but other areas of Scotland as well. That warming trend is consistent um, across Scotland and significant changes in rainfall. In addition to increases in rainfall we're also seeing more heavy rainfall events over the long term particularly in particular winter rainfall is increasing we're seeing a slight reduction in summer rainfall but we're still um, seeing these heavy rainfall events increasing across all seasons we're also seeing sea level rise around scotland's coast so these changes are set to continue and intensify in the decades ahead. A work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will be absolutely crucial in determining the extent of climate change that we have to deal with. But unfortunately, we can't stop future climate change completely. We have a certain amount of climate change built into our climate systems because of past and present day emissions. And we really have to understand what those changes might look like and work out how we can increase resilience and adapt in the face of those unavoidable changes. So Scotland has access to the UK climate projections produced by the Met Office Hadley Centre which provide a huge amount of detail around the type and extent of changes that we might experience under different um, emission scenarios and these key messages here just give you a sense as to the type of changes that we're dealing with and it's very much more of the same in terms of um, a continuation of the trends that we've already observed. So our weather will remain variable and may become more variable. Average temperatures will increase across all seasons. Typically summers we expect to actually be warmer and drier. Typical winters will be milder and wetter. But as I mentioned previously, intense heavy rainfall events are expected to increase in both winter and summer. Sea levels will rise and we'll see reduced snow, um, frost and snowfall. So these are significant changes. They highlight both the need to focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also to really respond and prepare um, and increase resilience to the kind of changes in climate that we've already seen and that we know we will see and experience in the years ahead. So last year, through the Adaptation Scotland programme, we began um, some discussions with major organisations in the Highland to think about how this region should respond to this challenge of adapting to climate change. In partnership with the Highland Council and the Community Planning Partnership, we conducted interviews with major organisations in the Highland to understand how they were being impacted by climate change and what they felt may need to happen in the future to enable um, this area to adapt. As part of this, we also um, issued with the Highland Council a public survey where we received around 200 responses from members of the public right across the Highlands who told us about their experiences of living with the impacts of climate change and what they felt should happen in the future. And all of this information has been really important in helping us to come to a consensus and to develop um, an approach for how this huge challenge of adapting to climate change might best be addressed in the highlands. So what did we learn around how people are being impacted by climate change in the highlands? I'll just share a couple of examples from the feedback we received from the, the public survey. People told us about all kinds of climate change impacts that are affecting them. Um, this graph here just describes some of the most common impacts that people fed back to us. For example, over 80% of people had experienced severe disruption due to um, roads being closed, 
whether that be through flooding, through landslides, just as a result of severe weather events. Um, wildfires affecting farmland, forestry and nature are also commonly reported with over 40% of people um, highlighting that as an impact. Um, as were disruptions to energy supply and disruptions to public transport also commonly noted, along with things like the cancellation of community events. We also saw um, people report damage to business premises and homes. Some people are affected um, by low water levels impacting on private water supplies. These are just a few of the impacts that people told us about that they had experienced already and that were concerning to them. People also took the time to share with us um, a lot of their sort of personal experience of living with these kind of impacts. We heard from farmers who had been really severely affected by multiple severe weather events, um, which had caused, for example, the beast in the east, the beast from the east severe weather event affecting um, livestock, followed by a severe drought um, or water shortage during 2018, further affecting their farms and businesses, and the sort of the compound impact of both of those events happening in a short space of time really affected their bottom line and their business viability. Similarly, we heard from people who had been affected by flooding, living with the sort of stress um, and worry about that, whether that could happen again, and all of the um, huge disruption um, involved in trying to deal with being flooded at home. So it was hugely valuable to hear um, directly from different people across the highlands around their experiences and we want to thank everybody who contributed and shared their time gave their time to share their views and experience and those experiences the impacts that people described uh, are very much reflective of what's happening across Scotland as a whole these images are just sometimes images that we use to describe and show climate change impacts that are occurring across Scotland so what should we do? At the end of our survey, we asked people, is more action needed to enable communities in the Highlands to adapt to climate change? And over 70% of uh, people who responded to our survey told us that they felt either urgent or very urgent action was needed to enable communities to adapt. So that sent a really strong message for us, confirming what organisations had also told us. Our in-depth interviews with organisations I mentioned previously also really picked up a lot of examples of different ways in which the Highlands are being impacted by climate change and highlighted that there would be very real benefits to a joined up approach to tackle this challenge of adapting to climate change perhaps to develop a shared evidence base to identify actions and to empower and work alongside communities. And so we come to the Highland Adapts Initiative. The business case for the Highland Adapts Initiative was developed last year and is currently being um, implemented and discussed widely across different organisations. We hope to set up the Highland Adapts Initiative in 2021. It will be a partnership initiative led by organisations based in the Highlands. Examples of the type of work that initiative will take forward include the development of a comprehensive climate risk assessment and action plan for the Highlands, with community involvement being very much at the heart of how that initiative has been taken forward. So I hope this presentation has been useful in giving you a sense as to how um, climate is changing in the north of Scotland and in Scotland as a whole. Some reflections on the types of impacts that we know are being experienced in the Highlands and a sense as to the partnership approach that may, will develop in the future to address this challenge. If you'd like to find out more information about adapting to climate change or you've got questions that you'd like to raise with us, please do get in touch through adaptationscotland.org.uk or email us at adaptationscotland at sniffer.org.uk. Thanks for listening to my presentation and bye for now. Good morning.
thank you for inviting me to speak at the Highland Climate Change Conference. My name is Andy Kerr. I'm from Climate Kick, which is a big European innovation uh, partnership. We've been working with uh, regions, with the municipalities, with cities across Europe to help them with the, the how. How do you deliver against these ambitious net zero or climate resilience goals? And I just want to offer a few insights from that work in the next couple of minutes. I think it's fair to say that in our experience, um, a decade of austerity, uh, limited staff capacity, annual, often meager budgets, uh, lengthy public consultations, silo departments, and so on, are all deeply unsuited to uh, regions and, and municip municipalities delivering against these ambitious goals. So what are the things that we think are, are crucial? Firstly, um, underpinning it all, it has to be political leadership, and by which I mean cross-party support for delivering against these goals. The timescales for delivering the transition over the next 10 to 15 years are much longer than normal political cycles, so you do need that cross-party support to deal with changes in political wins. Then the three main insights that I think uh, we can offer. One is that you really need to approach this with what we think of as an investment mindset. The scale of the funding required to improve every home, every building, to change the transport infrastructure, to enhance natural assets and so on, are cannot be delivered by public funding alone. So a cost mindset, which is focused on annual budgets and, and uh, balancing annual budgets, does not work. We need to look at the investment requirements, which for Highland will be billions over the next 10 to 15 years, understand where the debt sits, where the liabilities sit, understand where we can bring the public money in and where we need the private money in to support the co-benefits that come from that investment, the jobs, the uh, health and well-being for communities, the cleaner air and so on and so forth. So a lot of those changes uh, are, are beneficial, but we need to look at that long-term investment. The second one is around systems thinking. Um, no one has all of the answers, however good a consultant's presentation might be. We're dealing with complex systems with lots of moving parts. We're dealing with deeply unpredictable futures. So we have to understand the levers of change that we have available to us in each of these places. Is it access to finance? Is it new tech? Is it citizen engagement? Is it governance? Who chooses? And so on. Um, and understanding how we test these levers of change and learn very fast from, from an interconnected, coordinated set of projects and programs across the whole of Highland. And that system thinking is critical. And the final thing is democracy. Um, we cannot do this by imposing Imposing these changes on people. They have to be part of that solution, which means we need to rethink how we, how we work with communities, how we engage, how we ensure they have agency, how we deliver the decision making with them so that they are part of what we're trying to achieve. And if you can get all three of those, political leadership, investment mindset, systems thinking, and changing the way in which we interact and, 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 and think about engagement with people, then we have an opportunity of delivering these, these major goals. Um, good luck. My name is Lewis Ryder Jones, and I am the Deputy Chief Executive at Scotland's International Development Alliance, an organisation that I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, something very important to my work, uh, and I hope after this presentation you'll think they're important to yours too. Uh, the theme really for me about this chat today, uh, which will be a very brief introduction, um, is about promoting joined up thinking uh, and how we link that to the climate crisis. Um, so just a brief overview of what I'm gonna talk about for the next 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna talk about who we are as an organization and why I'm presenting on this issue. Um, I'll introduce the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, and try and link that to why they matter for the discussions that you're having today on the climate and ecological emergency that we're all facing. Um, I'll make reference to the impact that COVID-19 has had uh, on the global achievement of the SDGs to date. 
Um, and I'll finish by talking a little bit about what I think we need to do uh, uh, to do more for the SDGs uh, in the face of these converging crises. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me just tell you about us as an organisation. Uh, we are the membership body in Scotland for uh, organisations and individuals engaged in international development activities. Uh, we don't just represent NGOs, although that is a large constituent part of our membership. We also represent individuals, businesses, academic institutions and public sector bodies. Uh, um, I'd like to think that one day we'll have very active local government participation in international development issues as well. It's something that the SDGs promote uh, and I'll get onto that hopefully later. Um, really, we are here to try and make our members more powerful um, by enabling them to network, uh, helping them to learn from each other um, and helping them raise more funds. Um, and particularly uh, in my own role is trying to make sure that they have influence uh, uh, at, at government policy level in Scotland. Um, we also ask our members to, to sign up to our values. And this is where the, the SDGs come in, uh, because one of them refers to uh, an endorsement and commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So um, that's really where what binds our members together. Um, as you'll see from this next slide, uh, our members work in over 100 countries throughout the world, uh, doing a variety of different things that come under the banner or umbrella term global sustainable development. Um, that could be climate adaptation programs in Malawi, it could be girls' education projects in Ethiopia, it could be economic empowerment activities and microfinance stuff in Rwanda, or it could be the promotion of global citizenship here, education here in Scotland. Um, if you're interested to hear more about what our members do, um, well, at the end of last year, December 2019, we produced uh, our flagship report last year uh, called Working Towards the Global Goals. Um, that report uh, gives insight into the variety of activities that many of our members undertake with a bunch of case studies under each of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I'd really encourage you to, to click on the link at the end of the presentation and have a look at that if you're interested about the sort of things that our members do. I'd also like to highlight that some of our members uh, are based in the Highlands in Scotland. Um, so it'd be great for you to be able to find out those links if you're interested. So the SDGs, um, what are they and why are they important to this conversation? Well, the SDGs are, are, are really essentially a blueprint for action globally. Um, they are for all countries, whether rich, poor, uh, middle income or otherwise. Um, and they are designed to promote prosperity and protect the planet. They are about both people and planet, and that's critical to basically everything I'll say from here on in. Um, underneath the Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 individual goals. Um, uh, the agenda that they relate to is called the 2030 Agenda. So the 17 goals all have a variety of targets underneath them. Um, and we are uh, aiming as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a collection of 193 signatories to the SDGs as the countries across the world to achieve the SDGs by 2030, uh, which is a big ask. And I'll get onto that in a minute. Um, I really think before going into any other detail on this, it's really important to highlight that the SDGs are universal. So they matter as much here in Scotland as they do in Malawi, um, Indonesia or Colombia. Um, they are a UN um, framework. Um, they were adopted by the UK shortly after um, they were published back in 2015. Uh, and Nicola Sturgeon here in Scotland was one of the first global leaders to endorse them and commit to their achievement. Um, crucially though, they, are, they do build on a previous agenda, which were called the Millennium Development Goals. But the difference here was that the Millennium Development Goals uh, only focused on the world's poorest countries um, and they weren't a universal agenda. There was very much an us and them dynamic. The SDGs 
change that conversation and say that we're all in it together, um, or at least they try and do that anyway. Um, yeah, so I was asked to talk about whether we're on track or not, and the short answer to that is no, we're not. Um, we were way off track before COVID-19 hit. hit. Um, there's all sorts of statistics around that. Uh, I won't go into those um, because they're quite mind boggling. Um, but what's even more concerning is that COVID-19 has reversed decades of progress on poverty, healthcare and education globally, and will continue to do so uh, for the coming uh, months and maybe even years. Um, of the 169 targets underneath each uh, of the 17 SDGs, uh, it's very likely that we will miss almost all of them um, by quite some distance come 2030. Um, um, and the inter interdependent nature of the goals is often ignored uh, by uh, governments, businesses and actors across the world when they say they are helping towards one goal, they often forget that that might be detrimental towards another. And that is very critical to the conversation around how this links to climate and environment. But there is a plus. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has helped us see the interconnected and interlinked nature of global problems, probably more than anything uh, since um, our shared uh, fights in the global wars of the 20th century. Um, that fact is something I want to hold on to as we go through the rest of uh, my short presentation, um, because it's something that we can use the SDGs to really uh, push on. So the climate and ecological emergency through an SDG lens, um, why is it useful? Well, the, the image that we've got up in front of us here is, uh, I can't take credit for it. It was developed by the, the Scottish Government and it links the UN Sustainable Development Goals to Scotland's National Performance Framework, uh, which uh, there's a statu statutory requirement uh, to uh, report on and create at government level. Uh, but it is an, a, a framework that is intended to be adopted down to the local authority level. Um, and by everyone in Scotland. And then it also links to the climate change adaptation outcomes that were developed by the Scottish Government, uh, linking to Scotland's vision uh, through their national performance framework. What this shows is that there's an, an inherent interconnection between the goals, um, and there is an inherent interconnection between our well-being as people and the well-being of the planet. And I think that's that's where the SDGs really come into their own. They allow us to connect uh, our marine biodiversity to our own prosperity. Uh, they allow us to link uh, the importance of peace and justice to allow uh, for um, healthy, active citizens uh, connecting to their local environment. Um, but they also do something else. They help us connect the local, national and international levels. Um, the SDGs, when they were designed, were always intended to be adapted to the settings of each individual country. And they weren't supposed to be prescriptive in the way in which countries adopted them. Um, there are some targets that are not appropriate for Scotland within, for example, the poverty uh, targets at a global level. No one, thankfully, in Scotland lives on under on under a dollar fifty a day, but there are many people in the world and other countries who do. So a target halving extreme poverty does not have reference to Scotland. Nonetheless, there are important poverty targets underneath the poverty part of the sustainable development goals that do apply to Scotland. Um, I think ultimately they really remind us that action on climate can't sit in isolation from everything else. Uh, they help us act local while thinking global. Um, but I think there's another aspect to this, uh, and this is where the work that my organisation um, definitely connects to, which is that our ecological and climate crises know no borders. Um, 
And it is often the people who have done the least to cause the climate crisis in, uh, who are on the front line of its devastating impacts. The historical connection between carbon emissions here in an industrialised country like Scotland and the lack of that same historical connection to the climate crisis that the poorest uh, people in the world and in the lowest income countries have is quite stark. Um, so the SDGs help us at that international level remind us that there is a climate justice dimension to what we do on climate here in Scotland. We cannot separate uh, our action here from the uh, impacts of climate change elsewhere. We must consider what we do at that global level. Um, so before I finish, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what might be on the horizon for the SDGs and why I think we should be promoting them and adopting them. The SDGs are clearly an exceptionally useful tool uh, to frame and prioritise action on sustainable development. They link climate to all the other elements of what we do, and there's not one sector or industry within uh, our economy that can't use the SDGs uh, to fit what they do into a broader context. Um, but that's part of the problem, because if we cherry pick one SDG, like climate, and put it in isolation away from everything else that we do, then there is uh, potential problems and trade-offs that become inevitable. So we must demand more of both our government and, and uh, ourselves uh, to ensure that we uh, are using the SDGs in the right way. Um, I think particularly we need to encourage businesses to frame what they do using the SDGs in the holistic sense uh, and ensure that they can commit to meaningful purpose-driven enterprise um, and, 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 and avoid cherry picking or greenwashing. Um, I think it's really important that we promote the SDGs more. Uh, they are an incredibly useful tool for education around global problems and how we can link our local problems to the problems experienced elsewhere and equally the solutions to those problems in local and international contexts. Ultimately, the SDGs are for everyone. So they are a really useful framework to build partnerships between public, private and civil society. Um, they can foster collaboration and they can help us see our shared future um, as something brighter. The fact is that we've got less than 10 years to achieve the SDGs. So let's try and inspire each other to do more, uh, not just on climate, but on all the issues of sustainable development that the SDGs touch on. Um, if we do that, we might just have a hope of that brighter future. Um, we must stop seeing what we do in isolation from other things. Um, a bit further reading there for you, some of the work that we've done, the report that I referenced earlier, on working towards the global goals um, and uh, a recent publication around uh, some policy priorities that kind of link the sustainable development agenda to the climate agenda to international development here in Scotland uh, and some links to uh, some other interesting parts of uh, what I've touched upon today. So uh, thank you for listening um, and please uh, get in touch if you want to talk about anything I have mentioned today. Uh, have a great conference. Bye-bye. Chief Executive of the Avon Wildlife Trust, here to talk about Bristol's One City Ecological Emergency Strategy. Um, for those of you who don't know Avon Wildlife Trust, we're one of the 46 wildlife trusts in the country. Uh, our patch is the Bristol and Bath City region. We've got about 30 nature reserves and we do all the usual engagement work um, the Wildlife Trust do to get people to take action for wildlife. So I first raised the issue of the ecological emergency with the Mayor of Bristol back in November last year, um, looking at the massive decline in wildlife that we've seen globally, and with some of the shocking figures we've seen in David Attenborough documentaries recently, 
but this is not just a global issue there's also a national issue um, with very well-known and popular species simply having disappeared or, or at least declined drastically since the middle of the 20th century so 44 million nesting birds 30 million hedgehogs of 95 percent of our hedgehogs have disappeared over that time period and you know general decline in species with generalists doing better than specialists and then when we look at the local level um, down in the city region we've lost 96 percent of our starlings and our swifts since the mid-90s so it's no exaggeration to say there's a real emergency um, on the state of our wildlife at the moment. And when we look at insects in particular, we see right the way across the world in different places, we've got big declines in insects going on. Uh, we brought out a report last year on looking at the overall trends and why they matter. And when we look at the UK, the figures we've got don't seem as bad. But when you look at declines of insect eating birds, we're seeing 90 plus percent declines in, in those insect eating birds. So which just underlines the importance of insects as the base of the food chain. So the reasons why wildlife is declining, um, they differ between the UK and worldwide, but the main one is changes of land use. We've now got more power than we've ever had before. Farmers have got big tractors, which have enabled them to drain the wet places where the lapwings and the curlews used to be, to clear the scrub where the nightingales used to be. And gradually we've tidied things up. So there's just not enough habitat left for our wildlife. And we're seeing the results of that in extinction rates, which are 100 to 1,000 times greater than the, the natural background rate and you know, significant numbers of wildlife at risk of extinction. And that's bad enough just looking at land use change. But the IPCC last year suggested that if, if temperature goes up by one and a half degrees, we could lose 20 to 30 percent of the species on Earth. And that's the target. That's, you know, we don't think we're going to achieve that, which just shows how significant um, the, the risk to wildlife, to our ecosystems is at the moment. And that doesn't matter just to people who like watching David Attenborough. It's not just wildlife lovers. Wildlife makes up our ecosystems, which play an absolutely crucial role in our quality of life, from clean air, clean water, climate regulation, the role that insects and other in creatures play in dealing with the leaves leaves that fall in the autumn the dung you know what would we do without dung beetles and the the absolutely crucial one that 35 percent of the sorry 75 percent of the crops that we eat are pollinated by insects so we can't afford to say wildlife can just disappear and that's a sad but you know we can live without it this is the fundamentals of the life support system for the planet if we look at the difference in supermarkets between a picture of you know, produce which is um, pollinated by bees and what the same supermarket looks like without that produce, the images are quite stark. And when you look at the pictures like this from the Sichuan province of China, where the bees populations have collapsed to such an extent that their farmers are having to hand pollinate their pear trees, it shows you just how much we, we rely on nature. So Bob Watson, he be chief scientist of, of DEFRA for the UK, um, who's now working on the International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, you know, said last year that we are undermining the life support systems on which we depend, our economies depend, um, and we we really need to act now to tackle not just the climate emergency, which we do need to tackle, but the nature and ecological emergency as well. So it's a similar situation really with both of these emergencies. We've known what we need to do since the middle of the 20th century. And it's not that complicated, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But what we need to do is actually make those changes we all need to do, and we're running out of time to do that. So in, in Bristol, we're talking about a decade of transformation, 10 years when we really need to focus on tackling that climate and nature emergency. So and that's the, one of the key messages. It's not too late. We, stack, we can still change this. We can turn things around. We can stop wildlife declining. We can start to build more resilient ecosystems to support the lives that we, that we want to live for people and for wildlife. And the basic steps are quite simple. I mean, at, at the first thing, we need to stop destroying habitats. Uh, we, we need to make sure that what's, what's protected is, is properly looked after and remains where it is. We need to protect, link and enhance those places. So when wildlife sites are left isolated, the, the wildlife populations there shrink. They, they're not interchanging with other um, places they don't have that genetic diversity and the populations will gradually die out with um, you know with drought and flood or, or fire or whatever's causing it and not replenish so 
there needs to be an interconnected network. We need those wildlife corridors, those stepping stones between sites. We need the wider landscape to be managed sympathetically for wildlife. So we're not going to achieve it just by having really good nature reserves with wildlife corridors between them, because even then, the impact of what happens in the wider landscape is still significant. So the movements like the Nature Friendly Farming Network are absolutely essential to making sure that we can restore our wildlife. And there's some fantastic hopeful signs of, of change from some of the farming community at the moment, showing that people are really focused on uh, bringing back wildlife as well as growing food and, and absorbing carbon and a whole range of other services. And the final one is stopping the routine and unnecessary use of pesticides, which are undermining the, the foundations of the food webs uh, with the impacts they have on insects and, and other parts of the, the food web as, as the toxins build up um, through the food chains. So, as I said, these, these are things that we've known about for years, um, but we are running out of time to do them. So we really need that focus. And there are some good signs at the moment that people are beginning to take this seriously and beginning to see what can be done and some of the solutions are, are coming around. So I made this case in Bristol last November and in February, we declared an ecological emergency. So I, I stood up with the mayor in a cabinet meeting and uh, we declared an ecological emergency on behalf of the city. And the Bristol City Council are really taking this seriously, looking at how we change pesticide use, how we change verge mowing regimes, how we change how we manage our parks, our allotments, everything all the way through. But, and, and how we engage people in making the changes. But the mayor is always keen to, to, to remind us that, that people have a whole series of crises they're facing at the moment from you know, poverty, inequality, childhood hunger, um, and with the best will in the world, nature, climate emergencies are not going to be top of people's minds. So we as a city need to make it easy for people to do the right things. We need to design our cities in the right way. We need to make sure the new housing developments, the new business developments are happening the right way. And we need to look at retrofitting the homes and the communities that we already have to be able to put in place the solutions that we know are needed. So we declared the February and then just a few weeks ago in September, we launched our One City Ecological Emergency Strategy. So this is just setting out the top level goals that we need to achieve to, to turn around that decline and start rebuilding the abundance of wildlife and the resilience of the ecosystems that we rely on in the city. But this isn't a detailed action plan that's coming next. This is kind of step two. If step one was the declaration. Step two is the strategy. Step three is actually getting on with it and, and working out the action plan. And that's just what we're starting to do next. So the broad themes in the uh, strategy, there are four of them, space for nature, pesticides, pollution, and our wider footprint. And I'll just run through those quickly now. So on space for nature, we've committed to 30% of land in Bristol being managed for nature by 2030. And that means action at every level. So again, it's new developments, how we, how we develop things, how we manage our parks, how much wild space there is in our parks, it's about gardens and working with individuals and business parks and window boxes and looking at how we can get 30% of our city managed for nature. At the moment, about 15% of the city is nature reserves. And there'll be a lot more that's managed for nature informally, but we're looking to essentially double the amount of space that's managed for nature in the next 10 years. Next one we're looking at is, is pesticides. So we started with an initial target of reducing pesticide use by 50, at least 50% by 2030. I'm hoping we can do a lot better than that. I know a lot of places have gone pesticide free. So this is one of the things we're starting to look at already with the council. Uh, the third area is pollution. We've dealt with a lot of the gross pollution in, in our cities and our rivers uh, since the middle of the 20th century. We no longer have rivers that are clogged with industrial pollutants, but we've got new issues. We've got issues like microplastics, um, antidepressants having big impacts on our fish populations. So we're going to look at all the sources of pollution in the city, how we reduce that, the action we need to take to try and get all our waterways into good condition for our wildlife by 2030. Finally, we want to look at our wider footprint, going back to those global declines in wildlife, looking at how we can reduce our consumption of ecologically damaging products. So getting businesses to look at their supply chains, getting individuals to think about their choices. And this is an area where we, we've not found a great deal going on at the moment. There's some things that are beginning to happen, but businesses haven't really got to grips with them yet. So this is a big challenge. The, so 
as I said at the beginning, we, we are at the stage now where we're looking at how we make this happen. We're setting up the working groups to implement it. We're starting to look at where we can deliver the biggest bang for our buck in improving the ecological networks in Bristol, measuring that success and starting with tackling pesticides and looking at verge mowing. So thank you very much. I, I hope that's been useful. Um, I hope you'll all join the Wildlife Trust and other organisations who are taking action for wildlife. There's, there's lots of things that we can all do, um, including making the case. I hope lots more cities and, and areas will join us in declaring an ecological emergency and taking action. And hopefully you'll have seen the, the 30, 30, 30 campaign that the Wildlife Trust launched in, in September. We're trying to raise £30 million by 2030 to um, help to get that, achieve that 30% target of land in recovery for nature by 2030, right the way across the UK. Thank you very much. Have a great conference. I'm Alistair, and I work for Plant Life, the charity that saves wild plants and their habitats. One of these habitats is peat, which is home to rare plants and animals, and which also locks up huge amounts of carbon. We look after this habitat on our nature reserve in Caithness. We want to see peatlands restored across Scotland, and we also want to see an end to commercial peat extraction. Valuing and protecting peatlands will enable us to save these habitats, these species, and will ultimately help us save the planet. I'm Sarah James Gulp Roger, and I'm proud to say I was the 100th Green Ambassador and subsequently became an eco officer. This is something I've happily done for the last 10 years. My family brought me up on the make do and mend philosophy and this extends to every area of my life, particularly clothes and the home, as I love to make vintage styled clothing and love to upcycle things for my home. I'd much rather have vintage than new. Communicating earth science is what we do really well in global geoparks and so one of UNESCO's top priorities for us is communicating about climate change. So the managers of the Northwest Highlands Geopark are working with the Global Geoparks Network to help raise awareness of what is required to adapt or mitigate for climate change. Like Hebridean skies, we can slip into a dark mood about climate change. But Scotland's marine science community has reason for optimism and ambition. Our new initiative called People Ocean Planet combines marine science with the social sciences for influential communication and enabling actions for behavioural change. This is not just about individual actions, but how social change catalyzes government and commerce, more so than any amount of protest can. See our website to learn more. I'm Anne Thomas from the Black Isle. Please make all new buildings carbon neutral and insulate the old ones. That will cut fuel poverty and create jobs. I'm Fiona from Nairn. Why are you not doing more to protect plants and animals threatened with extinction? I'm Henry Dobson and I'm the site manager with the Woodland Trust uh, for this pine forest behind me, Loch Arcaig Pine Forest. Uh, you can see behind you to the, the right you have a beautiful restored part of the pine forest whereas to the left you have non-native conifers. Um, so our priority here is removing those non-native conifers uh, which in the short term is actually removing a lot of the carbon um, out of the forest, but in the, the medium to long term, um, a lot more carbon is going to be brought back out of the atmosphere by the regenerating native forest that recovers. Um, and all we really have to do to enable that to happen is manage the deer to the right level and the forest will return. Um, the uh, other um, carbon that we have locked up on site is locked up in Heat. and once we've removed the non-native conifers from that degraded ploughed up peat we are bringing in big machines to smooth it back out and it will start again to lock up carbon from the, the atmosphere as it recovers. So um, the amount of, of carbon we're, we're locking up here uh, might be a big volume um, compared to one household's emissions but on a, a Scotland scale, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference and it would take this sort of approach that we're taking here in managing deer numbers carefully to allow woodland and other natural habitats to, to recover. It would take that approach over um, a much larger 
part of the, the Highlands of Scotland to really make a big difference nationally. But I'm confident that that is something that could be achieved with the, the right political willpower. Hi, my name is Morag. Um, I'd like to start by pointing out that I am not an organised criminal. I am a member of Extinction Rebellion Highlands and Islands. I'd like to start by telling you a bit about Extinction Rebellion. We're a group of concerned citizens who have joined together to take non-violent direct action about the climate and ecological emergency. You might not always agree with our methods, for example, when we're lobbying you outside the council. But I think you'll agree that along with the youth strikers, we have made a difference. So th some of the things we've been undertaking in the Highlands. We were holding a weekly outreach in the city centre, currently curtailed by coronavirus. We petitioned Highland Council to declare a climate and ecological emergency, which they did in May 2019. And we've carried out several non-violent direct actions, including a die-in at the Eastgate Centre to highlight the damage caused by fast fashion, which accounts for 10% of global carbon emissions. We've recently undertaken a bank action to highlight the shameful amount of money our banks continue to contribute to fossil fuel industries, with Barclays as the number one bank in Europe coming in at a cool £91 billion. And we've done various banner drops exhorting banks, fossil fuel industries and government to urgently address the climate and ecological emergency. And we continue online and letter campaigns asking Highland Council to speed up meeting its commitment for Highland to be net zero by 2025. The good news is that Highland Council did declare a climate and ecological emergency in May 2019 and we congratulate you on that. We congratulate you as well on the 15% reduction on the carbon footprint of the Highland Council estate in the last year and on the rollout of the electrical vehicle charging points. But now for the bad news. Highland Council Estate only accounts for 3% of the entire carbon footprint of the Highlands. So what's the Council doing about the other 97%? We've yet to see a carbon emissions profile for Highland and we have yet to see an invitation to business, industry and the NHS to map its emissions and how to reduce them. Is there an engagement plan to support communities to reduce their carbon footprint? One of XR's demands is tell the truth and we believe that communities will listen. A quarter of Scotland's coastline lies within Highland Council. What's the flooding profile by 2050? People want to know. When are your planning decisions going to catch up with the climate and ecological emergency? For example, the UK peatland is equivalent to eight years worth of total emissions for the UK. So decisions such as the Amoyne spaceport do seem to us a kind of ecological vandalism. If you want to reach carbon zero by 2025, all new buildings should be carbon neutral with electrical chargers. And we ask you to uphold the appeal to not allow cool links to be destroyed. We were dismayed by the Council's initial decision to vote down the hydro uplift scheme in Loch Ness and want to ask you why you would vote down such a green initiative. And finally, have you got an action plan to get us to net zero by 2025? So here are some solutions. We urge you to integrate climate impact across all council decisions and policies. Make it everyone's responsibility, not just the climate teams or the climate panels. It would show the council's commitment if it was to divest from fossil fuels and invest in green energy and infrastructure. We know there are challenges in insulating many buildings in Highland, but there's also considerable fuel poverty and anything the Council can do to improve insulation will be well received. We ask you to ban Moorburn, make use of the huge potential of reforesting and take action against the shooting and trapping of animals threatened with extinction. And we urge you to use the expertise of the many grassroots organisations that already exist in Highland, as you have done in the COVID response. One way of doing this would be to create a citizens' assembly and to use the expertise of those already skilled up in sustainability. 
We believe many people would be willing to volunteer their expertise by linking in with the climate team. We owe it to future generations to leave them a world worth living in. We all as individuals need to modify our lifestyles, but that will not be enough. As our council, you have the responsibility to meet the huge challenge of delivering on the climate and ecological emergency you declared. XR is sometimes seen as a thorn in the flesh of the establishment, and we will continue to be so. But make no mistake, we are willing and eager to help you achieve the changes that are necessary. If Highland fails to meet this challenge, we will be a generation which has blood on its hands. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm Natalie from Bug Life. We should all be hugely concerned by the losses we are seeing in invertebrate populations. They are essential for all life and they provide key services that we simply cannot live without. Invertebrates are and will be impacted by climate change, but there's a number of things that you in the Highlands can do to help. Firstly, in October, Bug Life are launching our Beelines map for all of Scotland. In the Highlands, this map will highlight the key routes for pollinators, such as around the north coast and crossing between Port William and Inverness, from Torridon to Strathpeffer, from Ullapool to Bonner Bridge and from Laig to Tongue. By incorporating these routes into your management plans for green spaces, or by considering them along with our important invertebrate areas when you're considering planning applications, you can influence how verges, site boundaries, transport corridors are all managed for pollinators in the future. As a council, you could consider setting up a specific strategy for pollinators, as is happening elsewhere in Scotland. And you can consider, everyone can consider their maintenance routines and options for reducing or eliminating pesticides. And everyone can work with organisations such as Bug Life on important projects, like our new Species on the Edge project, which will help conserve the Northern Cleated Bee and the Great Yellow Bumblebee that both exist in the Highlands. There's a great amount more we can do for invertebrates, so I look forward to being able to work with you on this soon. I'm Lily, I'm 16 years old and I'm from Inverness. Teach the Future is a student-led campaign to get climate change into the education system. At Teach the Future, we want climate change to be taught across the whole curriculum, not just biology and geography. It's important that we equip students with the skills and the awareness they need to combat the climate crisis, which they are going to have to do. My generation and future generations must be taught about the effects of climate change and the ecological crisis it's going to have on their lives and their future. We need to be taught now. Hello, I'm Aoife. I'm 16 years old and I'm from Edinburgh. And building off what Lily has just said, we as students realise how essential it is to have climate education within our schools. And we at Teach the Future Scotland have come up with these four asks, which we believe when implemented will bring about the change that we need to see at the systemic level. So to start with, our first ask is a government commissioned review into how the whole of the Scottish formal education system is preparing students for the climate emergency and ecological crisis. Our second is the inclusion of the climate emergency and ecological crisis in teacher training and a new professional teaching qualification. The third ask is increased priority for sustainability in school inspections and publicly influencing educational rankings. And our fourth, which is a bill we have titled the Scottish Climate and Biodiversity Emergency Education Act. Hi, I'm Tess. I'm 16 and I'm from Perthshire. So far, Teach the Future Scotland has had a lot of success and we have gained the support of many people, not only in the public, but also in decision making positions. We've had a call with with John Swinney, which was really successful. We have continued contact with him and his advisors, and we hope to continue this contact in the run up to and after the election. We've also had a similar call with Beatrice Wisher and Willie Rennie. We hope to continue this contact too. We're really happy to have the support of all of these politicians. We've also emailed every single councillor in Scotland, which was a really big task. We have we hope to get the support of as many of these councillors as possible in order to have a platform to spread our message from. We've also had actions such as a banner drop. We really hope that we can have more of these actions when it becomes available, but 
unfortunately right now it is not safe to do so due to COVID. We also have some amazing supporting organisations who are in support of our campaign and do a lot to spread our message. We're really grateful for all the support we have and we're really happy how far we've come. Hello from the Edible Gardening Project at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. We encourage local community groups and members of the public to grow their own food through regular growing sessions and workshops, seasonal events and weekly Meet the Gardener information sessions. We also have the Organic Kitchen Garden where we grow produce for the garden's catering outlets. With our cafes on reduced capacity due to Covid, we're donating to local food projects, feeding those in need, and we even deliver on our e-cargo bike. Thanks, Sustrans. We champion climate-friendly food growing with farm-to-fork principles, reusing and recycling in the garden, composting and growing using organic techniques to ensure healthy soil and biodiverse gardens and allotments. up on Anlerg on the Abernethy Reserve. Ten kilometres out from the nearest road, I should think, um, up pretty high, about 800 metres up in the air. A long way out from any civilization. So we've got some uh, peatland restoration contractors um, in their diggers and their um, basically working on this degraded peatland ecosystem. And they're, uh, they're reprofiling peat hags um, so that the water doesn't flow through them as quickly, doesn't keep eroding the peat um, off the site and down to the rivers. So um, yeah, peatland restoration work kind of at its best. Another gang coming in with a, with a helicopter, dumping off stone, which we use to form dams which again slow the, the flow of the water off the off the peatland site so all about restoring the peatland and capturing the carbon carbon up in the hill. A big old operation and getting them out here I think took them all day, one day driving up from, uh, from the reserve down, down in Forest Lodge, um, all the way up, uh, vehicle tracks and then a couple of miles over the hill as well, so a big logistical challenge for sure getting them here. So the site they're working on this year is, is 92 hectares which kind of by itself is sort of a similar size to a lot of nature reserves in particularly in England or in the lowlands of Scotland, you know a fair chunk of land and then that's part of a about a thousand hectares of degraded peatland that we'll be working on over the next five to ten years and then that sits within the wider Abernethy Nature Reserve which is 14,000 hectares um, of forest and mountain and, and locks and rivers. And then that itself sits within the bigger Cairngorms Connect partnership area you know, real massive landscape scale stuff. To do the work we need funding. The funding's come from Peatland Action that's administered by uh, Nature Scott. Um, and then we've got support from the National Park Authority's uh, Peatland Officer um, that's going to give us a lot of practical advice about how to do it. Um, and then also we've got support from Cairngorms Connect with funding from the Endangered Landscapes uh, Programme um, which is helping us to manage the contractors uh, on the site. So a real big partnership project need all these different organizations and people to come together to make this happen. About 20% of Scotland's land area is covered by peatland. A very large proportion of that area is damaged or degraded. So approximately 75% of the area of peatland is degraded in some way. So this is an eroding peat bog 
that is gradually losing carbon uh, because it's either being washed down a river or lost to the atmosphere. What that essentially means is that the sources of emissions are balanced with the sinks of emissions by 2045. So at the moment, everything we do um, produces greenhouse gas emissions from its sort of industry, through transport, through business, through the food we eat. Um, they're producing emissions, they're the sources of emissions. And then there are sinks, there's carbon being taken out of the atmosphere. And um, that uh, can happen by planting trees, for example. So healthy peatland will um, store carbon, so it locks carbon in the ground. And unhealthy peatlands release carbon. So in the context of trying to get to net zero by 2045, we have to make sure that we um, move, sort of restore, enhance, move back to sort of protect our peatlands so that they work for us, so that they store the carbon and so that we, we reduce the emissions from the land. That's what it's all about really, you know, we um, spend a lot of time planning these projects, there's a lot of paperwork needing done, a lot of organising contracts and health and safety and planning all the detail and then it all comes to fruition after, you know, sometimes a few years of planning and then in a couple of years we'll come back up here and we'll see the difference that it's made, you know, we'll see the sphagnum and the heather starting to regrow and the, the peatlands hopefully by then will have stopped eroding, starting to rebuild, so yeah, it's when it all comes good. This is, this is a fantastic project because it makes real something that can often seem abstract. So in my day-to-day -day work, I talk about climate policy, about the role of land use in changing um, or contributing to um, uh, mitigating climate change. Uh, but here is really tangible, here there is work that's going on on the ground to, um, to lift the emissions of carbon from the land. And does it make all those meetings and reports <laughs> worthwhile <laughs> to see this? Yes. <laughs> We thought we were doing our bit for the planet, we thought we were doing our bit for sustainability and we almost felt like we had ticked that box so we didn't need to do anything more. And then it just hit us like an absolute sledgehammer, this blindingly stark realisation that we weren't doing nearly, nearly enough. To be able to have that first brewdog forest in Scotland is something that's, that's really special. When you really understand what you know, over 2,000 acres looks like it's a phenomenal scale. Scottish Highlands are some of the most beautiful parts of the planet, the kind of sweep of landscapes, the glens, the, the kind of greenery, and hopefully we can make it a tiny bit more beautiful. For me, this is the defining week of what we do. To become carbon negative, to create our own forests, I think it's by far the most significant thing we have ever done. We've been on a journey learning far more about what is actually happening to the climate, to the planet. When you look a few years or 10, 20 years down the line, we may not be able to grow barley or hops in certain regions around the world because, because of climate change, then that's a very sad place to be in. For me, it's all about what happens next. So what we've done up until now is good, but that gives us the ability to make a difference. So from now, 
is how can we make a difference as a company? How can we take a stand for the things that we believe in? On the, on the journey we've gone since 2007 and done all the things we've done, I think having someone there beside you all, all the time is, is, is great, you know, to be able to share all these incredible moments and things we've achieved as a business uh, during that time. When we kind of set out on this journey together, it was just, okay, let's see how far we can take this thing. We've became bigger now, we still stand up for the things that we believe in, we still wear our heart in our sleeve, and we still fight for the things that we're passionate about. And like, we are causing this carbon to go in the air, so we want to take responsibility, we want to own this, and we want to fix it ourselves. It's been too easy to kind of treat this as a side issue. We are getting to this stage where we can't be nice, nicey nicey about it. It's going to take a quite firm approach to get people to understand what we need to do to address the issue. My name is Keith Masson and I work as a climate change officer at the Highland Council in Inverness. Uh, and my role really is to help support sustainability efforts across the region and embed uh, low carbon legislation from the Scottish Government as much into Highland Council policy and into the day to day lives of people of Highland as possible. I'm quite an optimistic person and I like to think positively about the future, but this is the biggest single peril that we're going to face. And we need to get that message across extraordinarily powerfully, extraordinarily quickly. The international response to climate change um, has been um, some very frustrating because sometimes you seem to be moving forward and we seem to have agreements such as you know, the Breakthrough Paris Agreement that we had recently, which is a fantastic piece of work and I actually do genuinely hold some hope that we'll get some uh, movement from that. But we also know that uh, you know, there are also vested interests that, uh, that come in to hold back progress in these areas. Well, I'm Drew Hendry, and I'm the Member of Parliament for Inverness, Nair and Badenoch and Strathspey, which is the largest parliamentary name in the uh, Parliament at Westminster. Well, the people of Scotland are, by and large, a big-hearted, open-minded and collaborative people. And uh, nowhere is that more true than here in the Highlands of Scotland, uh, where my constituency is. Scotland, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the most unique um, places in the world in terms of its kind of natural heritage and environmental beauty. Got a little bit of everything. We've got an enormous coastline, mountains, peatlands, you know, wonderful agricultural land. And in such a small country, you know, Scotland is a country of, of extraordinary natural beauty and natural heritage. And I think rightly the, the Scottish Government and the people of Scotland want to protect that. We need to understand that whether or not we take action now to tackle climate change, we're going to be suffering the effects of it for many, many generations. So what do I mean by that? We still have 
concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that arose at the time of the Industrial Revolution. So any carbon dioxide that's emitted into the air now generally hangs around for anything between 20 and 200 years. So our ancestors, our recent ancestors, while they might have been oblivious to the impacts that they were going to have on future generations in terms of the change in climate, we're not oblivious and we can't be ignorant going forward. We need to get a handle on what we're putting into the environment now because it will have a lasting effect for many, many hundreds of years. From a Scottish perspective, we're going to see a range of, of impacts that are going to, to hit us hard in the coming years. For example, we're going to have longer, drier summers. We're going to have milder, wetter winters. We're going to have much more extreme um, temperatures, so more extreme in winter, more extreme in summer, and longer, drier spells. We're going to have less snowfall and less frost, um, which has big knock-on impacts on wildlife. And we're also going to have, uh, you know, the famous one that everyone knows about, rising sea levels, which for a small coastal country could be pretty devastating. We're going to see more, a lot more extreme weather events, a lot more landslides, a lot more erosion, a lot more storms and a lot more wind. And given the kind of coastal nature of the country and that a lot of people live at or near sea level, the impact of these events are really going to hit them hard. From my perspective, the biggest impact that climate change is going to have and the most devastating potentially is on our peatlands, our blanket bog. So about 1,500 square miles of highland is covered in, in blanket bog, um, which when it dries out, um, I mean, it, it needs cool, wet conditions in order to thrive. But when it dries out as a result of, of warmer temperatures, it releases massive quantities of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Now, carbon dioxide's bad enough, but methane is much, much more potent as a greenhouse gas. So all this sequestered carbon and methane, if it gets released into the atmosphere, could have absolutely devastating impacts for not just Scotland, but for the world. I mean, at this moment in time, the peatland in, in Caithness holds about the equivalent of uh, Scotland's total emissions for three years. We're looking at various changes to ecosystems. So you can have a situation where birds are hatching at the wrong time compared to their prey. So caterpillars might be emerging at a different time to when birds hatch which means that you know, their, their food supply is basically gone. And over and above the environmental aspect, you've got a lot of people whose livelihoods depend on the peatland in terms of water supply, in terms of agriculture, in terms of sheep farming, um, in terms of tourism. So it's not just the environmental impacts, it's the socioeconomic impacts that it will have on otherwise quite vulnerable local people people of Scotland, you know, rightly appreciate that, that climate change is an immediate and an urgent problem and that if we want to protect our natural heritage and, and our built environment, then we're going to need to do something about it. We are very good as a nation at, you know, pointing the finger at ourselves. I think you need to be when it comes to climate change and emissions. You, you, can, um, you can't fake it. You know, we know what we're emitting. If we're not doing well, we do something about it. The country has been very forward thinking in terms of its response to climate change. So in 2009, the Scottish Government passed the Climate Change Scotland Act, which is still the most ambitious piece of climate change legislation in the world. Some 42% of our uh, energy use by 2014 was uh, was from renewable sources, and by 2020 that'll be over 50%. Well, I think one of the uh, important things that we've learned in Scotland is that being an outward-looking country means that you have to make sure that you're not only uh, doing what you need to do at home to make sure that people thrive and survive, but actually look at the contribution you're making uh, on a wider basis. And I'm very proud that in Scotland what we've had is a cross-party um, and none 
um, collaboration on making sure that we've got some of the most challenging climate change targets um, on the planet, in fact, world leading. The Act placed uh, a kind of statutory duty on Scotland to reduce its emissions by 42% against our 1990-1991 base levels of emissions by the year 2020 and by 80% by 2050. We've done really well in that respect. We actually met that target six years early in 2014, which is absolutely fantastic, but that comes with a caveat. So the, the results um, and the 42% reduction is largely as a result of the decarbonisation of our electricity supply. So a shift away from fossil fuel power, away from coal and gas, and a shift towards renewables. Now that's fantastic. But it also came around as a result of uh, slightly warmer than average winters. So there was less demand on the electricity supply. So while it's terrific and we're doing really well and we're upping our ambitions, going forward it's going to be a lot more difficult to keep the pace up. And in many ways we're very lucky, even as a small country, there's an awful lot that we can do to help tackle climate change. We've got an enormous abundance of natural energy, you know, wind, hydro, solar, would you believe? enough to you know, really make an impact and drive down our emissions at a national level. Also, you're seeing local government and local authorities working really hard to engage with their communities and make an impact at a local level. I think as a country we really appreciate that while we are small we can make a big difference locally and act as a, you know, a good forerunner for the rest of the world. From a Scottish perspective, what we'll continue to do is to hopefully be a beacon to people by showing that the world-class targets that we've set and are achieving uh, for you know, renewable energy, for reducing our emissions, are, are something that can actually be of benefit to economies and societies and actually be there as a, a proof of concept that you can do things in a different way. What we want to do in Highland and in Scotland is empower people and help them understand what they can do and it is it's simple things but it can be as complex as you like but if you can do the little things the simple things right cumulatively that has an enormous impact and that's not just true here that's true around the world In the global climate, just now, political climate just now, there are a number of challenges I think that we will have to work really hard to make sure that the message gets across. Most countries around the world, with a few notable exceptions, now accept the unequivocal evidence that climate change is happening and that the, the facts put forward by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change aren't made up, they're not fake news, they're really important to, to grasp and to understand. What happened recently at the Paris Climate Change Agreement was groundbreaking in many ways. 195 countries came together and agreed that they were going to limit global temperature rise to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, which is incredible. To get 195 countries coming together and agreeing that is absolutely fantastic. The problem with it is there's no legally binding target within the Paris Agreement. So big emitters like the US and India and Russia 
in Western Europe and China have no legally enforceable target or any penalties for missing that target. So ultimately, they're going to have free reign as to how they address that target or do nothing. There's no way of penalizing them or, or, or legally enforcing that. We need to get the polluters to pay. Without that power to, to do that, we're not going to be able to fix the issue. I think we're getting to the stage now globally where we're seeing such massive, massive problems as a result of climate change that to see some nations turn and ignore it or look to take a step back from their commitments is extremely disappointing and we're not going to be looked upon well by future generations. It's important to understand that most countries around the world, with a few notable exceptions, now accept the unequivocal evidence that climate change is happening and that the, the facts put forward by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change aren't made up, they're not fake news, they're really important to, to grasp and to understand. I think if we don't take any action to combat climate change, if we just give up the ghost and say, uh, you know, this is just a free for all for people to do what they want and burn as much uh, fossil fuel into the future, don't look at new technology, don't look at ways of mitigating this, then we are looking at a future of very erratic uh, weather patterns. We're looking at a future of, you know, rising sea levels. And we've already seen, you know, some of the devastation through, you know, storms and global events that have uh, happened, uh, you know, around the world. But here locally as well, in Scotland, in the north of England, throughout the UK, where we've seen severe flooding, it absolutely wrecks lives um, and, you know, causes untold amounts of damage. And actually it doesn't make financial sense because uh, even if you're just looking at the pure cost of the cleanup and rebuild and so forth, if that effort was put into prevention in the first place, then there's more likelihood that you would get a better outcome in terms of those kinds of things. And in the global climate, just the political climate just now, there are a number of challenges I think that we will have to work really hard to make sure that the message gets across. As people, and you know, we're, we're all very well-meaning, I don't think anyone wants to actively go out there and cause additional climate change, but we're extraordinarily wasteful as humans. And we want things all the time. We always want new stuff. And it's because of that consumer culture and the demand for new things that drives climate change. I think one of the big problems that we face is that people don't understand that they can make a big difference to climate change and they do make a big difference to climate change on a day-to-day -day basis. Don't leave your television on standby. Switch the lights off when you go out of the room. If you can, walk or cycle or take public transport. Treat your car as a luxury, not as a necessity. For example, we know that in Scotland for a long time, uh, one of the major causes of early death has been a lack of exercise. Now that's you know, quite a shocking thing to actually say, but if you then turn that in the head and say, look, you don't need to make that unnecessary journey by a car, you can use a bike, you can walk, you can actually encourage people to actually tackle not just the climate change angle for it, but actually looking after their own health so that they get a, a benefit from it. So they'll live longer by actually reducing carbon use. If we eat fruit and vegetables and, and produce that's grown locally and in season, not only is our diet more varied and we're healthier, but we're reducing the impact we have on the planet because we don't need food to be transported halfway around the world. We really don't need that. Eat what's local and in season and you will go a long, long way to reducing your own carbon footprint. One of the biggest parts of most people's carbon footprint on an annual basis is flying. You know, the, the carbon dioxide that's released at altitude is much, much more potent than it is if it's released at ground level, and we're still trying to work out why that is. But if you can take a flight less a year and take the train instead, that could have a big, big impact. You know, around your home, check if there's drafts around your windows. Make sure that, you know, you're not losing energy 
needlessly. If you want to go a step further, look at installing measures like solar thermal heating so that you're not reliant on fossil fuels like gas or oil. Um, in terms of you know just your energy use, install a smart meter. Check what, what you're spending on an annual basis for each item in your house. Do you need to have everything plugged in? How do you make things more helpful for you at home with your family budget? Well, of course, you know, you don't have to burn so many lights. You can, you know, get better insulation. You can do those kinds of things. So I think to look at how people can make a change themselves in the very simple things. If you want to go even further, look at an electric vehicle. The costs of these are coming down all the time. When you come to replace your car, don't automatically go and get a quote for a petrol or diesel car go and have a look at and try out an electric vehicle. They're absolutely fantastic. And you know, ultimately you're spending about a seventh of what you would in fuel. And it's in a much, much low carb, more low carbon way. I think one of the other really important things that people can do is actually to speak to and engage with their local politicians because ultimately they're representing us. And if we're not letting them know that climate change is important to us and we care about the future of our kids and our grandkids, they're not gonna raise that in debates because they don't feel that it's important to people locally. So you need to get out and speak to people. Go and speak to your politician, go and attend their surgeries or write them a letter and tell them that you care and ask them to, to make it a, a proper issue in, in parliament continue the conversations about how this changes your lives, how making improvements can actually improve uh, your health, your well-being, your financial situation. Um, but of course, the global effects of that are also making sure that we're, uh, we're all working together to reduce the impact, the ongoing impact, and to stop things getting worse in terms of erratic weather patterns in the future. So think about what you can do in your home, think about what you can do in your daily commute, and think about what you can do to influence politicians uh, to make the right decisions and businesses to make the right decisions about how they conduct their business in the future. Without wanting to sound melodramatic, I think we're at a real crossroads in terms of humanity. And we are going to be remembered uh, as a generation in one of two ways. We're either going to be remembered as the generation that accepted the scientific consensus and the peril that we're about to face in respect of climate change and actually did something about it. Or we're going to be remembered as a generation that dismissed the scientific evidence and did nothing, thus condemning our children and our grandchildren to a future of misery that we can't even begin to comprehend at this moment in time. To me, that's a very simple choice and I hope it is for you too. Hi there, my name is Laura, also known as Less Waste Laura, and I am so excited to be introducing this section of the conference on individual responsibility. It is so important that we take up that responsibility as an individual to live more sustainably as far as possible in our own lives, 
not just because it does make an impact, no matter how small, but because we also sit in so many places and have a sphere of influence. Whether that is the people that you live with, the place that you work, the friends that you have, or the different societies, sports clubs, or just people you hang out with. We all have a sphere of influence of others around us. People are watching the way that we live and are interested when you live differently. No impact is too small and you can start with your own life, but also remember that all of our actions will build up over time. What might start with swapping a few things in your diet or going secondhand with your clothes or traveling by foot or by bike instead of driving might lead to bigger things like investing your money green by doing a staycation instead of a vacation, switching your energy at home to renewables or pushing within your workplace to divest from fossil fuels or so much more. Never think that you as an individual can't make a difference. We can all do so much, especially if many people across the world are taking up individual actions. I can't wait to hear what all of these speakers are going to say. So get your pens and pencils ready to take some notes because it's going to be amazing to hear what we can do as individuals to take responsibility for the ecological and climate emergency that's happening right now. I'm Maria Madcock and I'm talking about how to reduce your impact on climate change by living more sustainably. The reason for that is that four fifths of the carbon footprint generated by Scotland comes from the products and the materials we use. So we really need to do our bit to help reduce the carbon footprint of Scotland. And we can do this by following the principles of the waste hierarchy. So the best option is at the top. If we can prevent waste, that's best. If we can't prevent it, could we reuse it, then recycle, recover other values? So, for example, energy from waste. Or last option is to dispose of it in landfill. To put that in terms that maybe makes a bit more sense for us as individuals, I quite like this image I found this week which suggested that we should refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle, and then rot. So some really good, easy tips there that we can follow. So the first one was about preventing, refusing, and reducing. And really, this is about prevention is better than cure. So if we can say no to things like flyers and freebies and single-use items like napkins and coffee stirrers, then that's going to be the best option. We really want to avoid the single use, whatever it's made of. And it's not just plastics. If it's made of wood, it's biodegradable, any of those options. If it's still single use, we should be trying to avoid it. But also remember that the most sustainable option is the one that you already have in most cases. So I mentioned about single use, and here's where we get to the controversial bit. Plastic is not bad. It's neither inherently bad or good. It's just extremely long lasting, which is great for the reusable items. So things like keep cups and Tupperware. If we are reusing these items again and again and again, then plastic is really beneficial. But do make sure that you are reusing them. If you have a keep cup and it's sat in the cupboard and you forget to take it out with you, then actually that could be worse than having disposable cups. Where plastic is a problem is for the disposable items. So things like this coffee stirrer will be used for three seconds in your cup, but then will sit on this planet for 500 or so years and often ends up in the wrong places in the oceans, for example. I mentioned about single use being a problem, whatever it's made of. We often get asked about compostable and biodegradable packaging. These are an alternative to plastic, but often they are not disposed of properly and so end up being just as bad as plastic. For example, of this packaging needs to go to industrial composting facilities to break down. But if you have a food waste collection and you put it in there, chances are it may well go to anaerobic digestion plants, which would not break down these items. Even if they do get to industrial composting plants, 
often the picking line will take these things out because they can't tell if it's plastic, compostable, biodegradable, whatever it is. So chances are it will probably end up being landfilled or burnt. And if it is landfilled, it will create methane just like food waste. So it will contribute to climate change. So the key message is single use is the issue, really trying to avoid it, whatever it's made of. The next area where we can have a really big impact is with textiles. And there's been a lot about fast fashion in the press lately. And a lot of that is down to the fact that actually clothing has the fourth largest environmental impact after housing, transport and food. So we really need to think about our clothing choices. So think about when you are buying clothes, do you actually need it? Do an audit of what's actually in your wardrobe. Do you need anything new? If it's something for a special occasion, are you going to wear it more than once? If not, maybe you could rent it or borrow it or lease it. Could you buy it second hand? If you are going to buy new, think about maybe buying quality items that are going to last a long time or things that you can mix and match. In terms of using, think about laundry. That has an impact on the environment. So how we wash, dry and iron these things. Uh, if they need repairing, um, things that get faded, you know, do we dye them? Is there a sustainable dye that we can use? Um, lots of different things in terms of making those clothes last longer. And if we do want to dispose of them, what's the best way to dispose of them? So reuse, as I said, is the best. So if it can be sold or donated or swapped, then that's great. Textiles can technically be recycled in some cases, but it is very difficult because a lot of our clothes are made of a mixture of different uh, materials these days. So it makes recycling very difficult. So if we can reuse them, that is the best option. And on the subject of reuse, Onto something that's not so often talked about, reusable menstrual products. The issue here is that the average woman will go through 11,000 menstrual products in her lifetime, which is a huge amount of waste, but also the fact that a lot of this is plastic and a lot of this gets flushed down the toilet where it can end up in clogging drains or getting into the ocean. So we're really trying to make aware, people aware that there are alternatives out there that may suit you. So menstrual cups, reusable pads, period pants are all better options rather than these single use items. Food waste is another big area that uh, is quite often seen in the press. And the reason is that a third of the world's food is wasted and that waste is not just about the food that's wasted, but the producing, distributing, storing, packaging, cooking, all of these things have an impact on the environment. And food waste going to landfill creates methane gas. And we can't blame it on the hospitality industry at all because we are one of the biggest problems. Almost 50% of all food waste in Scotland comes from us, from the householders. And more than half of this food and drink is stuff that could have been eaten. So we're really trying to stress to people to think about planning, make a list when you go shopping and stick to it. Check what you've already got in your fridge, freezer and cupboard. Know your dates. The use by date is the only one you need to know about. That is the one that's about food safety. Use your freezer. Um, think about where you store things. So making sure that if, have a look at the packaging and it should give you advice uh, whether things will last longer in the cupboard or the fridge. Um, but the freezer is a great place to put things. If they're coming up to their use by date, stick them in there and then you can have them at another time. Or if you make too much of something, then freeze it for another meal another time. Perfect portions is not about weight control. This is about making sure that you are cooking the right amount that you are going to eat. So trying to make sure you don't end up with food waste or intentionally make too much. And then you can use the leftovers for another meal at another time. If like me, you live in an area where you don't have food waste collections 
or you have a garden, then home composting is a great option. Uh, I can use it to deal with my garden and my food waste and get free fertilizer for my garden. If you're going to go down the route of home composting, consider the type of compost bin. There's so many different types out there and lots of them will take different materials. Think about where you're going to locate it so it's convenient and then make sure you feed it a good mixture of greens and browns. There's lots of advice online about what is a green and what is a brown. And then, of course, at the end of the day, make sure you use that compost. We talked a little bit about reuse. The issue here is we are throwing things away. There are huge numbers of reusable sofas, TVs and T-shirts going into landfill every year in Scotland. So as I said, ideally with a lot of this stuff, if we can refuse them, I bet you a lot of these T-shirts are giveaways events. So if you're offered a T-shirt and you don't actually think you're likely to wear it, refuse it. But reuse is great. We talked about it before, if you can buy secondhand, if you can donate things, if you can sell them rather than throwing this stuff into landfill, that's going to be a much, much better option. And the last option to talk about is recycling. So this is fairly a bit further down the waste hierarchy, but still really important. And I know it is confusing as to what can and can't be recycled. So the key place to look is always on your council website. Do have a look and there will be guidance on there to help you. If there's anything you're not sure about, contact your council. It's better to ask than to put the wrong things in your recycling. We've got loads of websites, we've got social media. Please do contact me if you've got any questions, but that's a real quick whiz through of just some of the things that we can all be doing as individuals to try and reduce waste and reduce Scotland's impact on the environment. Thank you very much for your time. Hi there, my name's Tim and I work within the climate change team at Keep Scotland Beautiful. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about climate challenge from projects across Scotland that have provided opportunities for people to learn more about climate change and take action themselves. I'll also be covering the need to understand more about the climate emergency and the carbon impact of our choices. The Scottish Government's Climate Challenge Fund was launched in 2008. Over 1,150 projects across all 32 local authorities have been awarded CCF grants. Total funding since 2008 exceeds 111 million. The CCF supports community-led organisations in Scotland to tackle climate change by running projects that reduce local carbon emissions. But what do these projects look like? Well, they include fitting energy efficient measures in community buildings, projects to encourage people to move away from cars to more sustainable travel, initiatives to grow local food, and projects to reduce, reuse and recycle waste. We're very proud at Keep Scotland Beautiful to manage the CCF on behalf of the Scottish Government, and we have staff that support applicants, grant recipients and other community-led organisations wanting to take action on climate change. There are seven currently funded CCF projects across Highland. I do encourage you to become familiar with these projects and their activities they offer, which range from food growing, initiatives to tackle waste, sustainable travel and energy efficiency. The projects also work to increase awareness of climate change and activities that people can take to tackle it. I think one of the key things that climate challenge projects have done to inspire people to take personal action on climate change is working with their community. For a start, they're community led. The projects consult with our communities. They design and deliver projects with their community relevant to local needs and interests, which means in part they can have a ready-made audience. I also think it helps that the activities projects offer that can help to reduce carbon emissions are often interesting, useful, practical and even fun. Apart from being very well run, the community fridge run by Gate Church, which is pictured, works partly because it's such a sensible idea. People can pick up surplus food items for free that would have been landfilled. Other activities run by Climate Challenge from projects include cycle training and maintenance classes, active travel route planning, food growing training, zero waste cooking classes, clothing swap shops, repair cafes and home energy efficiency advice. CCF projects often go for applied learning, a subject based approach that makes climate change relevant for a specific project or community. 
for example, a food grain project discussing the impact of climate change and the carbon impact of food choices and food miles. And I think volunteers are another very important aspect of CCF projects. By having volunteering opportunities, some amazing people have come forward and shared their skills, experience, enthusiasm, empowering others in the community to take climate action. And I'd like to share three examples of these from our Climate Hero Awards. OMA has helped Rebecca for Glasgow achieve goals of saving 2,200 kilograms of waste through his volunteer repairer works. He supported community members to learn new repair and DIY skills, and he's learned English from scratch after arriving as an asylum seeker. Gerard, an e-bike expert at Aaron Eco Savvy, has set up and expanded the project's e-bike scheme. The first month of the e-bike scheme, working with employees at Lockranta Distillery, helped staff save over 600 miles of car travel in just four weeks. Tony, an event support volunteer at Edinburgh Lothian Regional Equality Council, has helped, all, has helped to organise events such as the Edinburgh Climate Festival and Swap Shops. She's gained a great sense of achievement from her volunteering and is also equipped with a confidence and abilities to take on new challenges. I mentioned earlier just how important it is for CCF projects to work with their community. And I think the Andrasta film is a great example of just what can happen when people in the community get the chance to have their say. Young people filmed and edited Andrasta over summer 2019 as part of a community LED by Energy Champions Climate Challenge Fund project run by Carloway and Gulson States on the Western Islands. The young people produced a fantastic film that gives a local angle to global issues. And I'd like to share the film with you now. Miss Mujikavil e Folishach Gavil in Tushka Dolby Tarnas Arshta as Hajirach Dolby Skirusal din the Dunya Ha Dolby Furach Isha As Taurik Davilus and Ojik Hanak Boonji Yunyukun Acho Yunik Filmi Yenavir Arachik Nagnahiche or hae tachert andraste, agus fashin yr son rutgen a yen of my yain. Livi a brewing rydunye, hashin yr clonchin gavilla yadiriv na chriplach, chanal na van yr fiugan tool, ach yn sio hain. Nyr a ha an a bla, ha an a nas fluke quidjag, agus ma shin, Nor ha ishke an, mar savest, di an ishke nas trauma. Che kunnerst de bavua ane ane noyeste huv huv ahara hug na gran hiche che edi edi ne mada mada ha muid gedi drausta agus che shen a priva ches a hake ni ane noyeste pujach mada ha ne likien bi as ne trainig noyeste agus a lekel noyeske mach. I guess had to have a move again. I should take heel or hug. I should have fought with a well unionist girl on her son of the local lushke and mach. Had done you okay? If you can tell, I thought she had tearing at a confusion. Show him Kutchak. When I see Greta Thunberg, it is here to look as high by Jenny school strikes son in Arinjach. But I'm just mentioning. Grau a tira mir vil ach grau kajenu, so hasi sing rut uava sach mor an de uist. Se a hiet strike ring sing, em er a kort tjeke vlachen varst a is fashing a kasselkles ne banners a is ne posters a va ring sing a is hasi sing lech ne pieper ne vaking em a is va tar filmige dal. Ringing a hinging suas, grushing dull a yanu badges, I'm with greater badges, as hui in puracum evelyn, yet as had the quiet briath. Well, how magavil, uh, uyuk doing you, Jeha Tahart, me and Blau, the crunya, a gasgazor, doing yoga, be doing yoga, I'm and a yet no, three feet brio na ele, I guess, 
bien chi bien namasher trochelens in haum de chach mit a bisschen gen rutken mi en so ha ma he ma hein gewill de unjag es munich of mi en de triple chen scho agis kutchok puter luch politics agis ele rutken a yen of mi en i want to strike because i feel that when you have an opinion on something um such as climate change and you want something to be done about it then you should be free to uh, act on that and i did that in the form of demonstrating outside the council building striking can actually bring around change and i think we've seen that across bigger cities um and you know scotland has announced a climate emergency because of young people striking on friday um i think on here in the western isles if we put more pressure to the council then they will um hurry the process in announcing a climate emergency um so it's just about encouraging young people to realize that their future is at stake hashin fiis agis famishin erkutchu hashin ak idiot of eschachrain har planet famish oring har nilen famish oring kutchak genasen a ser mura genshin rutken megain and draste Don't tell me it's fine cuz it's not all right All these problems I face in an uglier place each time And I don't understand how you can stand there and smile It's going away but for me it's not I think you'll agree that's a really powerful film. Young people who are taking responsibility for communicating about the climate emergency. Um I do encourage you to check out the full version of the film, which also includes um some of the local initiatives on the Western Isles to tackle climate change. It's a really good watch. So, what can you do to take responsibility to tackle climate change? Well, to take effective action to tackle climate change we do need to understand more about the climate emergency um and the carbon emissions that our activities cause um one of the things that we've been offering at keeps got beautiful is climate emergency training and this training is fully accredited by the carbon literacy project and attendees pledge individual and organizational climate action changes at the end of the training um we have training available for communities um that is free training funded by the scottish government and all climate challenge from project staff come on that one so that's absolutely fantastic and there's also a free training funded by the scottish government for youth workers at the moment um both of these training courses have been extremely popular um and do look out for new dates in the new year we're also at keeps got beautiful offering um bespoke training offers for businesses and local authorities because we realize that the circumstances um differ between local areas etc and we were absolutely delighted when glasgow city council became the first local authority in scotland to take this accredited training you can find out more about the training um on our website so all that remains for me to say is thank you ever so much for the invitation to speak today um our website addresses are just on the screen here um my contact details are there as well and our social media feeds thank you Hi everyone, my name is Holly Gillibrand and I'm 15 years old. And I'm going to start by saying that I don't get angry very often anymore. But while I was writing and researching for this speech, I found myself getting angrier and angrier because last year in May 2019, the Highland Council declared a climate and ecological emergency. On their website, they say they are working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions across the region, implement measures to adapt to a changing climate. and work in a sustainable way but once again their actions just don't add up for instance scotland has 60% of the uk's internationally important peatlands and the highlands is home to the flow country the largest area of blanket bog in europe peatlands are important for several reasons globally they hold more than twice the carbon stored in all the world's forest and they provide valuable habitat for wildlife And yet, only 5 months after their climate and ecological emergency declaration, the Highland Council gave the go ahead 
for the yearly removal of between 10,000 and 20,000 tonnes of peat at Moy Moss near Inverness. I could also mention the fact that the Highland Council missed their 2016-17 emissions reduction target by 8% of the space bought on the Moyne that received 457 objections but has been given the go-ahead anyway. But three minutes is not a lot of time, so I'm going to move on. I started school striking every single Friday morning 91 weeks ago because I didn't know what else to do. I was one of the first strikers in Scotland, but we soon had a national strikers network set up which became Scottish Youth Climate Strike, or SYCS. In SYCS, we organise countrywide strikes, plan campaigns, meet with politicians, and just don't act like children, although most of us are 15, 16, 17 years old. In September last year, before COVID-19 struck, and our politicians began to understand the meaning of the word crisis, SYCS organised 40,000 children to strike from school across Scotland. We were joined by 7 million across the world. In a Northern Times article about this conference, they mentioned the word behavioural change a number of times, so clearly the message is still not getting through. Behavioural or individual change, though important, is not going to solve this issue. Politicians like talking about it because it means they can pass the responsibility of this crisis onto normal people, while they continue building spaceports and new airplane terminals, investing in North Sea oil and digging up tens of thousands of tonnes of peat. We need to be pushing for system change, not individual change. However, the Council's answer to system change is to put LED lighting in work buildings and street lights and then call that carbon reduction measures. I sometimes feel like there is no hope, and I sometimes feel like giving up, but what is the alternative to acting? sitting at home waiting for the world to collapse around our heads. So my message to you is to please join us on the streets. Throughout history, from the suffragettes to the civil rights movement, change has always come from the bottom up. So please help us win this fight. Thank you. So hello and welcome to this talk on active travel and the green economic re recovery. Presented today will be myself, Ian, and my colleagues, Lisbeth, Collie, and Bo Hickey. Sustrans is a charity making it easy to walk, cycle, and wheel. In the Highlands, we are supporting schools in Inverness to promote children and families to walk, cycle, and wheel. We work with NHS Highlands to achieve healthier, happier staff, corporate social responsibility, and business savings. And we provide funding for ambitious projects to create safe, attractive, healthier places that will increase the number of everyday journeys by foot, bike and wheels. We are all working towards a, a focus of 20 minute neighbourhoods where all of our daily needs are met within a 20 minute walk from our homes. This eliminates transport poverty, which results from costly journeys and the needs for a car. So road transport accounts for over a quarter of all Scottish greenhouse gas emissions. The, High, the Highland Council declared a climate emergency in May 2019, and since lockdown, cycling numbers have increased dramatically, both nationally and in Inverness. However, traffic levels are back on the increase now, with numbers at 90% of pre-COVID levels in Inverness. It is clear that promoting active travel and improving public transport are key to tackling climate change and improving the nation's physical and mental health. So how do we do this? We need to change travel culture. The model here on the right represents the four different cultural contexts through which we can drive change. Each context is important and they all influence one another. Sadly, we do not have time to discuss the broader policy context in this talk. Instead, myself, Lisbeth and Bo will cover the individual, social and physical environment contexts respectively. So, we as individuals have the ability to make our own decisions and in doing so influence our friends, families and community. Here we're building culture change from the ground up. Behaviour change can seem complicated, but whether you are looking to give it a go yourself or aim to enthuse others, here are a few pointers that will help. The experience of freedom and joy of active travel speaks for itself. When I run activities in schools, it never fails to bring a smile to the faces of the pupils and staff involved. Let active travel do its own talking. It can be tricky to find the motivation to give active travel a try, but there are lots of opportunities throughout the year. 
Just try it for a week or one day a week for a month and go from there. Building capability is hugely important, whether that's working on your own cycling skills or helping your friends and family to build their own. Work a step at a time and build your own confidence as you go. Make it easy for yourself. Removing barriers makes it much more likely for people to choose to walk, cycle and wheel, as Bo will mention later on in this talk. Simple changes can make a big difference. Lastly, cycling is now more practical and accessible than ever. E-bikes in particular have revolutionised travel in more rural settings where the motor makes longer journey times more reliable and feasible on a regular basis. It also allows us to use bikes as a great mode of transport within city settings, moving um, equipment around like I am here in the top left. Lisbeth will now discuss the social context in the workplace. Thanks, Ian. I'm Lisbeth and I'm the Active Travel Engagement Officer with NHS Highland and Sustrans, and I'm here to talk about culture change in the workplace. Workplace culture is really important and it can be changed. Look around you and see what's normal, what's supported and what feels celebrated and valued in the workplace. It matters what our colleagues do, what our managers do and what our organisation does. And there's a lot of interplay between individual choice and organisational choice, between infrastructure and facilities and individual behaviour change. In the workplace, you have to do a bit of everything. NHS Highland has around 12,000 staff and 230 sites. So what it does as an employer really makes a difference. Here's a bike shelter at Larch House at the Public Health Office. Funded by Cycling Scotland, before this there wasn't a shelter and only a couple of staff cycled. Now it's regularly full. There's also an e-bike locker here with a couple of e-bikes for staff use, for work trips or for personal loan. As Ian said, e-bikes can be a game changer. They feel good, they're practical. So at work, it's important that we all support and celebrate staff who are trying to make things change make some changes ourselves in our day-to-day -day habits and try to integrate active travel into our day-to-day -day decision making. And why is that important? Well, potential benefits for an organisation are that we're part of that green economic recovery. We're doing something practical and, and meaningful. We'll have healthier, happier staff with reduced sickness absence. We're tackling transport poverty. We'll make savings in our transport budget We'll reduce our carbon and localised air pollution. We'll reduce pressure on parking. And even provision of e-bikes can open some work roles to non-drivers. Within our project, we've provided bikes and e-bikes for various teams and various sites for routine trips. We've provided shelters and lockers. There's a couple of e-bikes within the vehicle fleet at Rigmore. We provide loads of information and support and communications and signposting in, in various ways. We run regular free bike health checks and information stalls across various sites. We produce loads of generic resources to support workplace e-bike provision and we're sharing those really widely. And at a policy level, we've co-authored an active travel policy, which we hope will be adopted and embed active travel into everyday decision making. There is steady and increasing interest from staff. There's always loads to do. There's resources and support on the Way to Work website with a link at the end. And I'll hand over now to Bo to tell us a bit about her work with communities. OK, great. Thanks for that, Lisbeth and Ian. Following on from behaviour change, uh, it's important to note that active travel infrastructure and behaviour change really go hand in hand. This is especially important in rural communities where the connections might only be by road, there might be national speed limit and uh, people walking and cycling might be sharing with uh, larger vehicles like HGVs and whatnot. Now, in, in response to COVID-19, Sustrans had rolled out uh, Spaces for People funding, which was an emergency fund to facilitate the creation of this temporary infrastructure. This would allow people to physically distance. Um, and you can see these, these rolled out across, across towns throughout Highlands. 
Um, in the longer term, however, we've seen a significant growth in the number of community groups who, who are taking on infrastructure projects, uh, such as this one in uh, King Yusi. This is a really good sign for community planning initiatives, uh, and especially when the, the local authority might be stretched due to the, due to the pandemic. Um, we do have uh, common barriers that recur uh, with community projects that can uh, delay them coming to fruition. There's a complex design and planning process to get through in order to create uh, high quality and accessible infrastructure. And we also have uh, uh, often have hurdles with finding match funding and the, the resource. But one of the most truly preclusive barriers that we come across is where objections are raised to the projects. Um, the objections are often founded in the, the fear that removing space or reallocating space for active travel and removing it for private motor vehicles is going to have a negative impact on the local economy. Um, whereas research would suggest that that's just, that's just not true, it's a misperception. And actually, if you create space for active travel, uh, walking, cycling and wheeling, you'll increase footfall to local businesses. Well, also, you know, more generally, it's excellent for health and well-being within a local community. Um, so one of the best ways to be a, a positive advocate is to be vocal and to support, support local projects, you know, come along to uh, drop in consultations, for example, and be vocal, flag the innumerable benefits of active travel uh, and express that there is there's latent demand for these projects and that they will be used once they are once they are constructed. Um, great. Well, well th thanks for thanks for watching. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference, and we've got some some links that you might find beneficial to to everything that we've just been discussing. Thanks, everyone. Hi everyone, and welcome to this talk on the role of arts and culture in addressing the climate emergency. I'm Gemma Lawrence, and I work with Creative Carbon Scotland as the Culture Shift Manager of our Culture Shift programme. And my name is Lewis Conan -Rope. I also work at Creative Carbon Scotland as Culture Shift Officer. In this talk, um, we will share with you some background as to why we believe arts and culture has an essential role to play in the transformation to a more sustainable society. We'll then talk you through um, a bit of background to Creative Carbon Scotland's work and how we contribute towards this change. And um, I'll also provide some examples of a couple of culture shift projects which we've recently been involved in. And then I'll go on to talk a bit about how this work relates to the Highland context specifically and which issues matter most in this area. And then talk about some ways that you can get involved in our work in the future and what resources are available for you to make use of. Climate change poses fundamental challenges to the ways in which we live including how our food is tr produced, transported and consumed, how we manage and look after our natural environment, the ways in which our homes are, and buildings are heated, and how we move around. Transformational challenges if we're trying to net zero carbon reduction targets and adapt to the impacts of climate change that are already locked into the Earth system. At Creative Carbon Scotland, we believe that arts and culture have an essential role in achieving this transformation to a more environmentally sustainable, socially just society. As climate change is not just a political, scientific or economic issue, but is also about our culture and how we live. Arts and the creative practices of artists are well placed to help shape this wider culture. They can bring new ways of thinking through complex issues engaging communities through creative approaches, challenging accepted norms and values, and imagining completely different versions of the types of society we want now and for future generations. Creative Carbon Scotland exists as a charity to really focus exactly on harnessing this role of arts and culture in addressing the climate emergency. And we do this in a number of ways, which I thought I would just talk through now. The first is through supporting the cultural sector in reducing its own carbon emissions and adapting to the impacts of climate change. This includes our fantastic Green Arts Initiative, which supports a community of green champions within arts and cultural 
venues and organisations across Scotland to reduce their own impacts and also engage artists and audiences in more sustainable behaviours. We also play a role in ensuring that the role of culture is recognised as an essential part of the cultural shift to a more sustainable society. This includes through amplifying the voices and amazing examples of green work taking place within the cultural sector, and also talking to policymakers and funders about how they can implement green policies within their working practices and support and environmentally engaged arts. Finally, we support collaborations between arts and sustainability practitioners to harness different skills, perspectives and ways of working to address the climate emergency and related environmental issues. And this third area comes under our culture shift programme, which is what we're focusing on today. To help provide you with a bit more information, we thought we could talk through a couple of projects which we've recently been involved in relating to culture shift programme. The first is our Vela Communities project, which we were involved in between 2018 and 2020. And this was a two year initiative um, based with uh, an amazing charity in the south side of Glasgow called Bike for Good. Bike for Good were awarded funds as part of the Climate Challenge Fund and were in fact the 1000th project to be funded by the Climate Challenge Fund. So the project initially came from a desire from the Scottish Government to celebrate um, the amazing work of communities uh, taking place across Scotland, working across Scotland to address climate change, including Bike for Good's work. As part of this, we, um, we commissioned two artists, uh, theatre maker Lewis Hetherington and filmmaker Geraldine Heaney, to be embedded within Bike for Good's work for two years. And during this time, they co-produced films with young people and adults who were engaged and participants in Bike for Goods activities and services. Through this process of co-producing films and sharing them back with community members, the artists made use of their skills um, in creative engagement to explore the connections between cycling and climate change and community members' visions for a more sustainable, greener Glasgow. The second project is, our, uh, is a project that we're involved in called Seas of the Outer Hebrides, which also started in 2018 and is an ongoing. Creative Carbon Scotland was invited to work with the Seas of the Outer Hebrides project team to support the development of a community engagement strategy, which helped to understand community members' priorities for the marine environment and develop a shared vision for marine protected areas in the region. The creative collaborative approaches we took have been important in creating welcoming open environments for people to share their views and concerns and also have helped to draw out the less tangible aspects of people's lived experience, cultural heritage and relationship to the sea. In gathering these views and perspectives, these will help to inform the development of marine management plans which reflect communities' interests and concerns in the Outer Hebrides and ensure their sustainable management in the future. I'm now going to give an example of where the cultural approach to addressing climate change that we're advocating for is particularly relevant to the Highlands context. And that's the case of peat bogs. So the Highlands are home to a large number of Scotland's peat bogs, including the flow country blanket bogs up in the far north. And these are really important as wildlife refuges, but also as carbon sinks. So we need to find ways of protecting the peat bogs. What's interesting about the situation is scientifically, we really already know a great deal about what needs to be done to protect them and how, how we can look after them right now. But that hasn't yet translated really into sufficient action, although some good work is already taking place. And we think a lot of this is cultural. So it's to do with the fact that we haven't learned as a society to value or understand the peat bogs in the way we need to in order to really devote ourselves to protecting and looking after them. The peat bogs, I think it's fair to say, have something of a public image problem. We tend to regard them in potentially negative terms as not beautiful places, places to be avoided or maybe to be drained and made into more seemingly productive land. And what we really need is to learn to understand the peat bogs as beautiful and vital places. We need to learn to love them and understand how we depend on them in order to, for the scientific knowledge that we already have to really translate 
into genuine, very strong, significant action that's supported by local communities and, and the Scottish population in general. And there's a lot of projects which are trying to basically rehabilitate our sense of peat bogs and really see them as beautiful and valuable places. So there's projects like Flows to the Future, which is looking to promote the value of the flow country specifically, which is involved working with artists and bringing visitors into the bogs themselves for workshops and talks. There's also been an exhibition held in Edinburgh called Below the Blanket, where a bunch of artists put together creative responses to the peat bogs of the Highlands. These responses included visual art, but also music and more kind of participatory work. And these were displayed in an exhibition in Edinburgh. So it was able to sort of bring the experiences of those peat bogs as translated by those artists to new audiences who would probably never visit those peat bogs and never gain that first hand understanding. So it's trying to use the arts as a way of building that more personal understanding among audiences who are unlikely to garner that kind of interest otherwise. And I'll just wrap up by talking about some ways that you can get involved with our work. So the main means of doing this is by taking part in the Green Teas event series and network. So Green Teas events are informal events that we organise roughly on a monthly basis, which bring together people coming from arts and culture, as well as climate and environmental backgrounds. And the aim is to bring people from these different backgrounds together to learn from each other, to share to meet in order to work on new projects in the future. Uh, and these events take the form of talks, discussions, workshops, uh, more creative things like uh, chances to explore habitats and go on walks together and take tours. Uh, they're organised as a mixture of online and in-person events. And there's also records of all of them on our websites. There are reports, there are podcasts, there are video recordings. So even if you're not able to attend in person, and this is often the case for people coming from different parts of the country, then there are still ways to hear about what's happened. And there are also ways to get in touch with other members of the Green Teas Network. So we host a database on our website which lists people who are interested in the roles of arts and culture in addressing climate change and want others to get in touch with them. So there are ways to reach out and make connections with others also. And there are plenty of other bits and pieces on our website as well. Lots of smaller resources, articles, news items. So do keep up to speed with those as well. You're more than welcome to get in touch with us for further information. Do visit our website, creativecarbonscotland.com or get in touch with Gemma or I via our emails and you can also follow us on social media at CC Scotland so on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn or Facebook as your preference goes. So that's everything that just leaves it to me to say thanks very much for listening and please do get in touch. Thanks very much. Good afternoon everyone. Last year I had the honour of delivering the St Andrew's Day Lecture at Scotland House in Brussels. I chose for my subject tourism and climate change and called it Responsible Tourism. Today I want to pick on four headlines in that, but first let me reiterate what I've always believed should be the guiding principles behind national tourism investment. First, tourism is an economic activity delivering the maximum wealth and jobs for the minimum environmental and social disruption to the host community. Second, leisure activities are provided by a civilised society to enhance the well-being of its citizens. And thirdly, that whilst there are overlaps between one and two, clarity of objective is essential in strategic planning and investment. Let me now pick my first headline, which is the strength of Scotland's brand. At Visit Scotland, we regularly refresh the expression of Scotland's brand, the latest being the Scotland is Now campaign and only in Scotland. But the core values of the Scottish brand have been unchanged for decades. They are our culture, history and traditions. They are our quality of people, 
and the warmth of our welcome. And they are perhaps most importantly for today, the outstanding quality of our environment. So anything which strengthens our visitors' perceptions of our environment and their, our attitude to it strengthens our core brand. My second headline is what our future visitors want to buy. Our research shows that Generation Z and Generation Alpha, basically the millennial generations, want to buy experiences. They want to share them on social media and they want those experiences to share their values. So the availability of green product and in experiences influences their choice of destination. Investment in low or no carbon therefore pays commercial dividends. And my third headline is that technology is moving at exponential speed and has reached an inflection point. Three quick examples. First, Cranfield have equipped a Britain Norman Islander aircraft with electric engines. Following successful trials, it is hoped that these will be deployed in 2022 for inter-island services in the Orkneys. This means that the most environmentally friendly way to tour the Orkneys may well be in an aeroplane. Secondly, developments in sodium ion flat cells mean that batteries are available which can store sufficient power to smooth out intermittency from renewable energy sources. This means that a remote hospitality venue or a small community could be off-grid and off-carbon. And lastly, the UK's two largest oil companies, BP and Shell, have both in recent accounts written off trillions in underground reserves which they now agree are unusable. And they both plan to be carbon neutral within a decade or so. There are many other examples, but they all indicate a public and political desire to change away from carbon and engineering technologies that are either close to or already delivering that possibility. So my fourth and final headline, sustainability must include communities. To fulfill my first principle, the benefits to host communities must outweigh by a significant margin the costs, which is why at Visit Scotland we have added to sustainable tourism the need to work with communities to gain maximum benefit for minimum disruption and taking the whole together we call it responsible tourism. So my conclusion, our brand is strong and green investment strengthens it. Our future visitors want to buy that enhanced green experience. An investment in a low carbon product will deliver value, create jobs and wealth, and deliver value for communities. Have a great afternoon. Hey, my name is Magnus Davidson and I'm a research associate based at the Environmental Research Institute, North Island College, UHI. Today, we're going to talk around renewable energy in the Highland Council region. Quickly, before we start, the, the statistics that we use are updated at various intervals. So we use the most recent statistics, and these are dated in the presentation. The geography of this is very much centered on the Highland Council region, which you can see in blue on the right. And we largely talk around generation and largely in gigawatt hours. The Highlands have very much been an energy region for hundreds, if not thousands of years. In the beginning, that would have been peat and wood. In the last 100 to 200 years, we've moved to coal at Brora, and then more recently, oil and gas from the North Sea, as well as nuclear energy generation here in Caithness. The focus of today's presentation and moving forward is very much renewable energy. And in the Highlands, we have a lot of renewable resources, uh, perhaps some more than others from the list below. Here in the Highlands, the geography and climate very much make us Scotland's renewable energy powerhouse. Highland Council region produces around 7,500 gigawatt hours of renewable electricity, which is over a quarter of Scotland's total renewable electricity generation. For a bit of context, the next highest producer is Dumfries and Galloway, which only produces around 10% of Scotland's total demand. Although we generate a lot of electricity, electricity is only just one part of the energy mix as well as the energy challenge. 
We use lots of different energy sources in our daily lives, whether that's the heater homes, runner washer machines or driver car. On the right hand side, you can see in terms of Scottish final energy consumption where electricity fits. And you can see heat and transport actually make up most of our energy requirements. So Highland Renewables are largely electricity focused, but we'll explore how heat and transport can be decarbonised in later slides, largely around electricity generated here in the Highlands. Here in Highland, we actually produce the most amount of electricity from onshore wind, hydro and tidal stream. We also have additional generation from biomass and solar PV, although on a much lower scale compared to elsewhere in Scotland and the UK. We have uh, Scotland's largest offshore wind farm uh, in the Murray Firth, although this isn't counted in our statistics because the cable makes landfall in Murray. We're actually the second highest UK local authority area in terms of total renewable electricity generation second only behind Selby and Yorkshire because of their massive converted coal units to biomass. To give some of these numbers some context, Highland produces 27% of Scotland's electricity, but we consume 6% of Scotland's total electricity. Therefore, we generate a lot more than we consume. We produce around 69% of Scotland's total domestic electricity demand, so all the electricity used in our homes. We also generate enough electricity to meet over 400% of our own electricity demand. That's domestic, industrial and commercial, all electricity that we use here in Highland. If we're talking only about homes, we actually produce uh, enough electricity, enough renewable electricity to meet over 1000% of our own uh, domestic demand. Is this good? Yes, it very much is good, but is it enough? No, it definitely not enough. To explain why this isn't enough, Highland Council region has around 33% of Scotland's total land area, but we only have around 4% of Scotland's total population. We have a small population, but a large amount of renewable resources. Densely populated areas can't generate enough renewable energy to meet their own demand. For that context here, Glasgow only produces around 2% of its electricity consumption from renewables. Therefore, renewable energy needs transferred from areas of high generation and low demand to areas of low generation and high demand. That means we have an obligation here in Highland to transfer energy, largely electricity, from Highland to the rest of Scotland. We can see from previous slides that Highland generates a large amount of renewable electricity. And we know from news reports and press releases that Scotland is doing very well at coming close to its 100% renewable electricity target for 2020. Uh, last year, we were around 90% of that target. But we also need to decarbonise heat and transport. In terms of heat, only around 6.6% comes from renewables, and in terms of transport, we're even worse, only around 4% comes from renewables. We can see on the right hand side the share of renewable energy in terms of gross final energy consumption for Scotland, and the targets for 2030 and the targets for 2020. In terms of decarbonisation of heat and transport, um, we're largely going to look to electrification to decarbonise these sectors, which means we're going to have to increase the amount of renewable electricity that we generate. In terms of electrification of heat and transport, we can electrify heat and transport directly through things like electric vehicles and heat pumps. We can also electrify heat and transport via green hydrogen from electrolysis. Green hydrogen is largely uh, the splitting of water from renewable sources to form oxygen and hydrogen. We then use hydrogen as an energy vector. Both of these require far greater renewable electricity capacity, however. It's estimated by 2050 we'll need, on top of the 5 gigawatts ish of peak demand that we currently require, an extra 4 to 10 gigawatts of peak demand. In terms of renewable capacity, this means even greater capacity because of the intermittency of renewable energy sources. There are alternative ways and that, that really relies on fossil fuels and carbon capture and storage technology or an increase in nuclear generation. But the way that we're looking in Scotland to go is very much more renewable energy and electrification of heat and transport from renewable electricity. 
So we need to build more renewable energy capacity here in Scotland. And can we build more in the Highlands? The answer to that is a definite yes. There's an increasing move to offshore renewables, that's offshore wind in the Murray Firth, as well as around the coast of Highland. Uh, tidal stream in the Pentland Firth, here in Caithness, as well as off the west coast. Uh, wave energy, if we can crack the technological challenge of that generation source. Also onshore renewables, there's plenty of space for more onshore renewables, even around environmental and landscape designations. Um, we'll certainly need more pump storage if we're going to solve the intermittency issue of renewable energy. Highland region produces a lot of renewable electricity, but we will need to produce an even greater amount to help achieve global climate change targets. With this slide, I want to give you an indication of where spend is found across the whole of the UK for various developments here in Highland. This is a study for SSE that looks at four of their developments in the Great Glen and Glendale area. And over the lifetime of the project, you can see around 30% is found in the local area itself, increasing to around 36% for Highland, increasing to around three quarters for Scotland, and increasing then again for the UK. There are many social benefits from the decentralisation of energy to rural areas like Highland region. We've seen community funds pumping millions of pounds into rural economies, and we potentially have many benefits from net zero industry utilising renewable energy generation closer to the source. At the bottom, we can see an example of a job from the construction of a wind farm in North Sutherland that has meant that a young man has been able to stay in the area. And we hope that benefits like this might help solve some of the challenges we have here in Highland like depopulation outlined in the map above. So in terms of how this fits with the wider emissions picture, we know that we need to reduce emissions by reducing energy use and shifting energy generation to renewable sources. We also need to create greater carbon sinks by restoring peatlands and increasing forestry cover. It's obvious that Highland region has a large part to play in both of these. On the right hand side, we have a schematic of Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions, on the top, we've got emissions from various sectors, and on the bottom, we've got carbon sinks from forestry. The challenge for net zero is making sure that these two match in size. That means reducing emissions and increasing our carbon sinks. It's the job of renewable energy to reduce those blue boxes in size. I hope you've enjoyed that whirlwind presentation through renewable energy generation in Highland. And I'll leave you with this quote from Tom Johnson, the mastermind behind hydro development in Scotland, but particularly here in Highland. I'm more than happy to answer any questions on this presentation or wider energy issues. Please do just get in touch via the email below. Many thanks. Hello there. Hi. Um, my name's Bryony. Uh, Brian e. Beck, and I'm the Sustainable Transport Coordinator for the Highlands and Islands at Home Energy Scotland. Uh, so today I'm going to be doing um, a PowerPoint uh, presentation talking you through uh, choosing sustainable travel. So what I'm going to do for just now is I'm going to turn my camera off and then I'll come back um, later on. So yeah, I do hope you enjoy it and um, you, you will still hear me. So let's just get on with it then. So, <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking to you about choosing sustainable travel and what benefits that can have for the environment and how we can mitigate against the effects of climate change by ways of reducing carbon. And I hope that you enjoy today's presentation. So, just a wee bit about what I'm going to be talking through today. Um, so carbon emissions, government targets, sustainable travel hierarchies, uh, benefits of sustainable travel and sustainable travel funding. So a wee bit about Home Energy Scotland. We're funded by the Scottish Government and managed by Energy Savings Trust. We're a network of local advice centres, offices in Inverness, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow and Ayr. And we offer free and partial energy advice tailored to each consumer's needs. And we're open 8 till 8, Monday to Friday, and 9 till 5 on Saturdays. Energy Savings Trust are a social enterprise with a charitable foundation established by the UK government in 1992. 200 staff across offices in Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. 
They provide advice and support to promote the transition to a smart, decarbonised, decentralised energy system. They focus on homes, communities and transport to deliver the wider societal and environmental benefits of energy saving while actively mitigating climate change. So the big picture. There is no doubt now that climate change is a threat to humans and our way of living. Climate change is mainly caused by the release of carbon dioxide, CO2, into our atmosphere. The problem. Well, our lifestyles completely rely on fossil fuels. Despite the growing increase in renewable ele electricity generation in Scotland, there is still a long way to go to completely eliminate fossil fuels. There is the misconception that the industry sector is causing the bigger problem and that they can do more. It is true that they can be doing more within the industry sector, but it's also true that we can be doing more in the domestic se sector. So Scotland's carbon emissions. So between 1990 and 2018, carbon emissions have dropped by 70.1% in energy supply, 32.2% in business, 15.9% in agriculture and 22.2% in residential. However, transport's only dropped 4.9% and it's now the single biggest contributor to greenhouse gases in Scotland. So Scottish transport and greenhouse gas emissions. So as you can see, transport contributes to 37% of Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions, 40% of which comes from passenger cars. There are now 3 million cars registered in Scotland, the highest car ownership has ever been. Government targets. Following the significant report published by the Committee for Climate Change in 2019, the Scottish Government responded by accepting a new recommended target of meeting net zero carbon emissions by 2045. Previously, this was to achieve 80% reduction by 2050. The Scottish Government have also announced that they will phase out the need for petrol and diesel cars by 2032 in the last two programme for government documents. It won't be an outright ban, but rather putting policies and incentives in place to phase out new petrol and diesel car sales by 2032, focusing on any new cars being ultra low emission. Another important announcement was the introduction of four low emission zones in Scotland's major cities. These will take place in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Dundee. So what is a sustainable transport hierarchy? Well, what I'd like you to do is, if you've got a pen and paper, if you can uh, jot down this triangle, and I'd like you to create your own, trans what you think the sustainable transport hierarchy is. So think about having the most sustainable travel options at the top, i.e. the travel options with the smallest carbon footprint, and the least sustainable, those with the highest carbon footprint at the bottom. So I'll give you some time to do that. And you can just be thinking about, you know, the ways that you do your traveling, thinking about your decisions, you know, your behavior towards how you're going to reduce your carbon. So now I'll show you what Home Energy Scotland's low carbon transport hierarchy looks like. So here we are. So as you can see, we've got air down the bottom because that's our very carbon intensive travel and we've got walking um, active travel um, at the top there. So every time you either go out to work or go to the shops, think about your travel hierarchy and which mode of transport will be best for the environment. So benefits of traveling sustainably. It reduces our carbon footprint, helping to create a greener, healthier Scotland. It saves us money, it means extra pocket money or money for savings and experiences, that sort of thing. And health, it improves our health. We live a more comfortable lifestyle with more energy and it's also, you know, better for the environment um, breathing in cleaner air. So if you change your petrol or diesel to an electric vehicle, your average carbon dioxide saving would be 69% and your average annual saving of costs would be £330. The benefits of EVs are charge while you park, it's such a better use of your time, and the majority of EV drivers charge from home or at their destination, i.e. their work or their shops. Uh, they're smoother, quieter drive, and all EVs are automatic, and the lack of engine noise is very noticeable. Also, did you know 1.5 million households in the UK with a second car, and it never travels more than 100 miles a day, 
these are a perfect choice for an EV. Also, just to let you know, the three vehicles that are pictured here, we've got the Hyundai Ioniq on the left, the Kia e Niro in the middle, and the Renault Zoe on the right. These are all eligible for um, the funding that I'll be discussing in a couple of slides later. So if you do change your transport um, modes, you can have some carbon savings. So if you decide to car share, you can save on average um, an annual of £390 um, saving with three loan drivers sharing a daily nine mile commute by car. Car clubs, 48% less CO2 than the average petrol or diesel car. If you change your car to public transport, you save 74% carbon dioxide on rail and 43% by changing to the bus. If you decide to cycle into work, you've got an average annual saving of £438 if you replace your daily five mile commute by car with an e-bike. And if you walk to work just once a week, you can have an annual saving of just £140 a year. So funding that's available through Home Energy Scotland and Energy Savings Trust. So this is what um, I deal with in, in my role on a day-to-day -day basis. So all loans are 0% interest free and the e-bikes is up to £3,000 for domestic customers and up to £30,000 for businesses. So they can either um, purchase a few e-bikes and a few e-cargo bikes or they can you know, purchase just e-bikes or just e-cargo bikes. It's up to the businesses themselves. We've got the new, um, if you purchase a brand new um, electric vehicle, you've got up to £35,000 um, interest free loan for the domestic customers and up to £120,000 for businesses, uh, capped at each car being £35,000. So if you're a business, you can get three to four cars um, in your fleet with that loan. We've also got the used EV loan, and this is up to £20,000 interest free for both domestic and businesses. Uh, and it is just one car per household and per business um, for that one. We've got the £350 charge point installation grant funding as well for when you do purchase your electric vehicle. And there is some other funding available as well. But thank you very much for watching this presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or queries, then please contact me um, by any of the details um, listed here. So I'll just put my video back on. Hello everyone. <laughs> so yeah, that's my email there, um, my phone number. So if there's anything that you'd like to ask or anything that you think I could be helping with, um, then please do just uh, get in touch. But yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and um, have a good day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you everyone. Goodbye. My name is Ryan Felber and I'm the local energy efficiency business advisor for Zero Waste Scotland's energy efficiency business support service. In this short video this afternoon as part of the Highland Climate Ch Change Conference, I want to run through and let you know a little bit about the support that we provide to SME businesses across the whole of the Highlands and Scotland. We are a programme of Zero Waste Scotland and we are funded by the Scottish Government and ERDF, European Regional Development Fund. We provide free and impartial and expert support to Scottish SME sized businesses and we do this by identifying opportunities they have to reduce their energy and more importantly reduce their carbon footprints, carbon emissions. We have helped thousands of businesses through the years and have identified over 200 million in cost savings. Typical savings are around 50,000 pounds per business, and this is over the lifetime of the projects. And that equates to approximately a 24% saving on the energy bills. The support we provide is there to try and help overcome certain barriers that are preventing businesses and organizations to become more energy efficient and reduce their carbon emissions. These are identified on the slide there, being lack of time, lack of technical skills, management buy-in, and lack of finance. And I'd like to very quickly run through how we help businesses overcome these barriers through our support. 
We appreciate that businesses organizations have very little time and this is not an area they normally focus on or devote a lot of time to. So to help and support that, we provide a dedicated advisor such as myself to help and work through the process with um, the businesses. Um, as I said, we have local advisors. As for myself, I cover Inverness, Highlands and Islands, um, and we support the businesses by identifying opportunities and projects that we might be able to support uh, with and advise on. We then use external framework contractors as our technical specialists to help and provide a detailed report that quantifies and analyzes the opportunities that are available to businesses and organizations. These are detailed recommendations, which include estimated project costs, financial and carbon savings. We understand that sometimes there's a bit of commitment required to go ahead and implement uh, opportunities that we've identified. Um, and this may involve putting a strong business case. Uh, and this could be detailing the report, presenting the reports to senior management and buy-in. Um, and this is to ensure that all parties involved in the organization understand the report that we've produced, understand the opportunities, understand how we've come to the conclusions and recommendations that we have. It's likely that most opportunities are likely to cost uh, businesses or require some sort of investment. To help businesses with this, we provide them with support in identifying suitable finance. One of the opportunities they have is to apply for the Scottish Government's SME loan. This is an interest-free loan with a value between anything between £1,000 up to £100,000. It is an unsecured loan with no setup charges. As of the 20th of October, there is a 30% cashback on energy efficiency measures. This is up to the value of £10,000 per business. There is a further pot of £10,000 to provide 75% cashback on selected renewable heat technologies. This totals to a potential of £20,000 of cashback for each organisation. This can also further be set against capital allowances and the loan is automatically spread over an eight year period. So hopefully these four elements have helped understand how we try and overcome these barriers uh, and really support businesses to identify the opportunities uh, and take them through to a stage of helping them with finance to implement if that's what they decide to do. Here you can see a quick glimpse of the resource uh, recommended opportunities from an exemplar report where you can see that, for example, um, the, the first example there is solar PV, a fantastic opportunity to reduce carbon emissions through that. We've identified a financial cost benefit uh, for this particular business and the size of the system of about £500 a year with an investment of just about £4,500. So that has a payback of about 9.2 years. And as you can see, quite substantial reduction in kilowatt hours usage uh, and 0.8 tons of carbon emissions reduced. Um, so fantastic opportunity and, and certainly a, a great way to help towards climate change and reduction of climate change. So how to get in touch? If you'd like to find out more, you can obviously log on to our website, which is energy.zerowayscotland.org.uk. There's information, including case studies, documents, and, um, uh, and, and other support that's available through our program. You can call our helpline on 0808 808 2262 and speak to one of my colleagues who will guide you through the process and, and one of us uh, to discuss the, the opportunities for your business. There is also an email address if you wish to use that. And I have included in this video my contact details if you wish to discuss anything covered in this presentation. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen and uh, we hope that we'd hear from you and we can help and support your business. Thank you. Hello. 
My name is Joe Perry and in this presentation I'm going to be talking about the Flow Country World Heritage Site project. World Heritage Site status is the highest award of its kind and gaining this status for the Flow Country would be a significant accolade for the Highlands. Towards the end of 2019, the Peatlands Partnership submitted a technical evaluation to the UK government, making the case that the Flow Country should be the next UK candidate to be put forward to UNESCO for World Heritage Site status. Only one UK site can be put forward each year, so we were delighted when we heard at the start of this year that the Flow Country had been chosen. The next stage of the process is to put a full nomination together and send it to UNESCO in Paris, where they will judge the Flow Country along with other candidates from across the world. At the moment, we are on track to submit to UNESCO in 2022. But before we start, uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce you to the Flow Country. If you're with us for the earlier biodiversity and habitat section, you will have already heard about this remarkable place from Dr. Roxanne Anderson, a peatland expert from the Environmental Research Institute, who is also helping on this World Heritage Site project. The Flow Country is a vast expanse of peatland stretching across Caithness and Sutherland. You'll see the full extent in more detail on the next on the next page. The Flow Country contains the largest blanket bog in Europe and perhaps the best example of this habitat in the whole world. Blanket bog is not only an increasingly rare habitat, but it is also a remarkable carbon store, locking away far more carbon um, than that of our woodlands. Now, there is not currently a map of the Flow Country, and one of the aims of the World Heritage Site project was to ask local communities where they considered the Flow Country to be. We showed them these two maps that you can see on the screen at drop-in sessions within the consultation boundary, which you can see as a red line on both maps. So we asked everyone within that red line where they considered the Flow Country to be. The map on the left shows the core peatland areas in blue and the possible buffer areas in yellow. These buffer areas might be where plantation forestry exists or recently existed. The map on the right shows the, ex um, the existing areas of protection for peatlands within the consultation boundary. Um, it's important to say that the red line is not the Flow Country World Heritage Site boundary line. That's the consultation line. So we asked everyone within that area where they considered it to be. Of course, knowing where the peatlands are and where they are protected is just part of the equation. We also needed to hear the local stories and ensure that we were drawing a flow country boundary that made sense culturally as well as scientifically. The process of drawing our boundary is ongoing and will involve, will involve more consultation with local communities over the coming two years. So stage one of the project saw a number of profile raising events, including a ministerial visit to the Flow Country by MSPs Murray Gudgeon and Gail Ross, who are joined in the photo on the left by the chair of the Flow Country World Heritage Site Project, Francis Gunn, who lives up in Tongue. The picture on the top right is an example of the stalls we set up at events and drop in sessions over a six month consultation period in early 2019. These events helped us to gather the views of members of the public and raise awareness of the Flow Country's candidacy for World Heritage Site status. We also held a week-long stall at Edinburgh Botanic Gardens during the 2019 Fringe Festival, which coincided with their wonderful Below the Blanket art installation. The picture in the bottom right came from one of three speaking events we held, featuring BBC presenters Professor Ian Stewart and Neil Oliver, as well as Chair of Bath City World Heritage Site, Professor Barry Gilbertson. In total, our consultation events led to face-to-face -face interactions with around 1,300 people, which we were really happy with. So an important question is, what is a World Heritage Site? And it might seem a little um, dramatic to use this picture, but I think Notre Dame in Flames really highlights um, what it means to have and to possibly lose a World Heritage Site. So a World Heritage Site is a landmark or an area which is of significance not only to its own country, but to the whole world. So when Notre Dame uh, was on fire, people around the world felt that they were losing something. 
It wasn't just a tragedy for Paris or for France or even for Europe, but for the whole world. So we believe that the flow country deserves the same status, that of shared heritage, international shared heritage. It is a remarkable habitat, the best of its kind anywhere in the world, and everyone, no matter where you live, um, should be proud of it and would suffer if it was damaged or neglected. So I now just want to quickly look at our existing World Heritage Sites here in Scotland so that you can see the standard that the flow country will be judged against. You'll notice that they are mostly man-made structures, so we will also look at some natural sites um, from other countries. Underneath each site's picture is a little quote which is taken from the listing that they have on UNESCO's site. So maybe the closest to home, you've, probably quite a few of you have visited it, the heart of Neolithic Orkney, including um, Scara Bray and Mays Howe. So it's a major historic, major prehistoric, sorry, um, cultural landscape, graphically depicting life 5,000 years ago, unquestionably among the most important Neolithic sites in Western Europe. We've then got the fourth bridge, which marks an important milestone in bridge design and construction. New Lanark, an exceptional example of a purpose-built 18th century mill village. Um, and St Kilda, which is a mixed site, so it's both, both a cultural site and a natural site. It's a seabird sanctuary without parallel in Europe, and it bears exceptional testimony to over two millennia of human occupation in extreme conditions. And we've also got the Edinburgh New and Old Towns. It's a remarkable juxtaposition of two clearly articulated urban planning phenomena, medieval old town and the Georgia new town. And then the Antonine Wall, which is part of a World Heritage Site, which has locations across Europe. So it's the furthest extent of the Roman Empire in, in different directions. So it's not just in Scotland, it's also in Africa and other parts of Europe. So it represents the Antonine Wall, represents the borderline of the Roman Empire at its greatest extent in the second century AD. Now, as I mentioned, I also included a couple of natural world heritage sites because we don't have a purely natural world heritage site in Scotland. So the flow country would be the first one. So I included the two most famous natural world heritage sites in the world, the Grand Canyon and the Great Barrier Reef. So the Great Barrier Reef contains the world's largest collection of coral reefs with 400 types of coral, one and a half thousand species of fish and 4,000 types of mollusk. And Grand Canyon National Park considered one of the world's most visually powerful landscapes, an exceptional example of biological environments at different elevations. So now we've got a beautiful picture of the flow country here and a possible quote from the flow country's potential inclusion on UNESCO site in the future. So the flow country contains the largest and best quality expanse of blanket bog anywhere in the world and unique assemblages of bird species at the extremes of their usual range. So what would be the benefits of having a World Heritage Site? Now, World Heritage Site status would bring a lot of economic, social and environmental benefits to Highland and should certainly be considered a boon to the green recovery. We know that World Heritage Sites have a positive impact on local and national eco and sustainable tourism attracting the types of tourists who are more likely to stay longer and spend more in Caithness and Sutherland. This is also an incredibly important opportunity for peatlands around the world. Currently, there is no peatland world heritage site. Peatlands are such important habitats for biodiversity, leisure, carbon sequestration and culture. So it's about time that there was one on the world heritage site list. And we feel that it would be appropriate if such a site were in Scotland, as we have such a rich peatland resource here. I just wanted to finish on these beautiful pictures, which were taken by some of our European volunteers who came to the flow country last year as part of a World Heritage Site Volunteers project. And it just highlights that these are the sorts of projects that are just another example of some of the benefits that World Heritage Site status could bring to the area. So I worked with these volunteers personally and they all left the project and they all left to the north of Scotland. Um, with a renewed appreciation of peatlands and a better understanding of how this habitat um, can be protected and why it should be protected. 
So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening and do keep an eye out for the next stage of the World Heritage Site project, which is set to start in early 2021. Uh, David Whiteford. Uh, I chair something called the North Highland Initiative and i um, delighted to speak today at this virtual Highland Climate Change Conference. This element of the day is around the green recovery and uh, I'm delighted to, to add my piece into the conference. So my, my title for, for this piece is, is Recovery Through Collaboration. We are of course in the midst of a, a perfect storm um, we have the, the, the challenge of climate change, we have the COVID-19 emergency, uh, a massive pandemic as we all know and dealing with that and recovering from that is so important. And then of course we have Brexit which is about to impact upon us um, in, a, in a potentially very significant way. I really want to talk about the opportunity for the multi-sectoral collaboration. Behind me here um, we see energy transition in practice, moving from oil and gas into renewables. And, and that is a phenomenal opportunity for the North Highlands, for the Highlands of Scotland to, to, to embrace that change and to add value through it. It's a great um, opportunity too to um, create high level quality jobs and, uh, and encourage more people to come to the Highlands. So renewables um, and offshore renewables um, in, in the form of, of colossal wind farms it could be absolutely transformational and and hopefully create another sector for energy in terms of hydrogen and hopefully uh, very near here creating that energy is is, is, a, is a, again an opportunity to add value um, my view is uh, we have tremendous um, natural produce in the highlands we probably don't add enough value to it and, and this energy might a way in which we can look to premiumise our produce better than we currently do at the moment. Um, that again is multi-sectoral potential. We have most amazing um, beef and lamb in our area. The great story about its low carbon production systems that we can tell. We need to look to, um, to carbon neutral packaging. So we need innovation and there is a chance to have an innovation centre through the city region and I would hope this is an impetus now to get on and build that innovation centre and to add, to add value and premiumise our produce. In terms of tourism, we've got a great opportunity here to grow and continue the move to sustainable tourism. The Highlands are an amazing place to come to. We've seen that. That's going to become greater with the in, increased number of staycationers through the caused by the pandemic, but it's a, a great opportunity um, to show, to showcase our um, a, a amazing part of, of the world. The North Coast 500 is, has helped put this area on the map. We need to transition that now into a slow tourism, getting people to stay here longer, to add value to our communities and to help us to grow more businesses that are, again, in turn, are sustainable. We need infrastructure for that, and we need investment in that, in terms of um, electrification of um, the route, uh, not just the NC500, but the whole area. So for cars, for buses, and for our trains. Again, mentioning hydrogen, again, this is a collaboration opportunity. Our trains could become hydrogen, our buses could be hydrogen. We need more charging points for cars and for bicycles. So transport is key to moving sustainable tourism forward. All of this needs investment, and that investment, I would say, comes through collaboration. So it's a public-private partnership here. My view too is that we should, have, we should do what Norway did, create a sovereign fund. That way we could use the fund to implement some of the things that we need to do. Norway did that for oil and gas and that fund is legend throughout the world. It's investing in, in many, many places. It's worth in the region of two and a half trillion pounds. Now, we can't do that with oil and gas, but we could do it with offshore wind. 
there is going to be something like 30 gigawatts of energy produced out there. A small royalty from that would help us grow our carbon neutral infrastructure. So I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's, it's a massive opportunity. It, it, this sovereign fund would need to come again as a collaboration from the Scottish Government and Westminster Government. I do think it, would, it really would help us transition into the kind of economy we need to become. I do think too that we can look to monetize the opportunity here. We have massive natural capital here. We need to grow more forestry. We have already in existence some of the, the, the greatest and largest peatlands in, in Europe. But through carbon sequestration, we could help to monetize those and then invest again in that circular green economy and grow the, the opportunity for us all. Hello, my name is David Richardson and I'm the FSB's Development Manager for the Highlands and Islands. Now the FSB is member-led, member-run and member-funded. We're by far the largest business organisation in the Highlands and indeed right across the UK. And we're the only business organisation with members in every corner of the land. We exist, our, our mission is to help our members achieve their ambitions. And one of the key ways in which we do this is to give them a voice in the corridors of power. Nobody listens to small uh, individual businesses, but collectively through the FSB, they have a very loud voice indeed. And we use this voice, supplemented by hard data from our many surveys and from case studies, to produce policies which we can present to, to politicians and policymakers that will help make this country an even better place to start up, manage and grow a business. Now let's get on with the presentation. Thinking small to deliver big results, climate change and small highland businesses. Now, no one knows for sure, but there are somewhere around 25,000 registered and unregistered businesses in the Highlands, of which some 24,000 or 24,500 have fewer than 50 employees and are classed as small businesses. Small businesses are found in every community, and this dominance is good for the Highlands, for these businesses tend to be agile and highly adaptable, and they're well-placed to respond to ever-evolving circumstances. They're also immensely loyal to their communities, and preserving the character of their local areas is very important to them too. You might be surprised to hear, first, that research published by FSB Scotland five years ago found that at a half of all Scottish businesses are based in the home. And second, that after the last recession, which followed the 2008 bank collapse, 90% of people who were made unemployed moved back into the labour market via a small business or setting up their own businesses becoming self-employed. Now, you might imagine that these small, agile Highland firms would be ideally positioned to seize the business opportunities presented by climate change and, and to overcome the many threats. And under normal circumstances, of course, you'd be right. However, the world has changed and now, well, many now find themselves being tossed about like shuttlecocks in a hurricane. And the need to invest to meet climate change targets could not have come at a worse time for them. This time last year, Brexit and the prospect of a no deal dominated the horizon and our quarterly FSB Scotland Business Confidence Index found that confidence had slumped to a record low. But little did we know. Highland businesses and economies now find themselves threatened from many fronts. COVID, Brexit, the consequences of our ageing, declining population and, of course, climate change. But, but thanks to severely constricted cash flows and in some cases major COVID related debt, they now lack the resources, these businesses, the resources they need to fight back. The expression, it never rains but it pours, doesn't just apply to the climate. So focusing on climate change, by any measure, the Scottish Government's aim of reducing net emissions to zero by 2045, five years ahead of the UK's target, is very ambitious and challenging, as is its interim target of reducing emissions by 75% by 2030. Recognising that the scale of the behavioural change required will impact massively on small businesses, and that the country can only meet the, its, these targets if small businesses fulfil their roles to the full, FSB Scotland is both supporting the Climate Citizens Assembly and assisting with the production of the Scottish Government's forthcoming Climate Action Plan. 
As other speakers will no doubt have discussed, this action plan will focus on how we will meet the target, the targets covering a range of key areas, everything from transport to industry and energy to agriculture. Now, fundamental to this whole process is the appreciation that while small businesses dominate the Highland and Scottish scene, they're very far from being a homogenous group. Their acceptance of their personal responsibilities for meeting climate change targets varies enormously, some seeing it as core to their business model and some taking little or no interest at all. The overwhelming majority, however, will mirror the wider public and be somewhere in the middle. They will have some awareness of the challenges and they'll want to feel that they are taking action, but they simply won't appreciate the full magnitude and extent of the changes speeding down the tracks towards them and nor how they're going to be affected. As we've seen, many of our most agile and successful Highland businesses now find themselves fighting for survival as never before. Their backs really are to the wall. So we need to think about how we will help them to understand both this new threat and the opportunities that a green recovery will bring, what we need them to do, and how they can best be supported to fulfill the rules demanded of them. Now, there are obviously many areas of climate policy that have implications for small businesses, but today I'm going to focus on the two with far-reaching consequences for the Highlands. The first concerns property. It's perhaps ironic that a very traditional region like the Highlands, with our colder, wetter and windier climate, is characterised by old traditional homes and business premises that are anything but energy efficient, and which can often be downright cold, damp and draughty. It seems highly likely that we are about to see a range of new measures, primarily regulatory and tax-based, that will incentivise a move away from cold, energy inefficient buildings by obliging property owners or maybe their tenants to invest in making properties more energy efficient. Clearly, these costs will hit bottom lines hard while having little or no positive impact on incomes. Surviving COVID thus far has cost small Scottish businesses an additional eye-watering £2.3 billion in borrowing through schemes like C-Bills, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, and B-Bills, the Bounce Back Loan Scheme. £2.3 billion in Scotland alone. Few businesses will be in, a, in any position to borrow more to undertake this non-income related work on their premises. If responding to the climate change crisis was going to be tough for small businesses before COVID, well, it's become 10 times harder now. So in short, improvements will be very expensive and businesses need to understand which will attract public sector support and which will be left to them to sort out for themselves. What shape will the incentives to get businesses to comply take? Increase property taxes? And if it simply isn't cost effective to bring current premises up to scratch, what's the financial environmental cost of building new? And is it affordable? And what happens if operators can't afford to upgrade properties like hotels or self-catering or whatever and have to close? What impact will this have on their communities and the wider economy? And what happens if no one else can afford to take on the properties? Will decaying buildings litter the countryside as a reminder of what once was? Now, the other um, area of concern is transport and logistics. Things are moving fast here too. The phasing out of the need for diesel and petrol cars by 2032 is not far away. And will electric vehicles be an adequate replacement by then, given that, well, private vehicles are vital to life in the Highlands, where population densities can never justify intensive public uh, transport service provision? Will electric vehicles be affordable? And will everyone and their customers have access to charges and so on? To say nothing of issues regarding infrastructure and the grid. And what are the visitor economy? Tourism is the Highlands' most important industry, and its success is based very heavily on free will and free movement. What are the implications of the changes on this industry? Will changes be accepted and behaviours change sufficiently to make it all work? And then there are deliveries. As ever more goods are ordered online from people's homes, we see growing swarms of white vans rushing around delivering goods, and it's very inefficient and wasteful is a new integrated delivery system serving a wide range of different businesses based all over the country workable and affordable a sort of parcel force mark ii the main conclusion from both these points is that businesses really can't be expected to make and pay for all the changes themselves many simply can't afford to now they need urgent guidance on what is going to happen and on what is expected of them and they need support without which it's hard to see how some in remote and fragile communities will survive or the overall climate change targets be met. 
Now, we obviously can't ignore the opportunities. And one thing we can be certain of is that small Highland businesses will be at the forefront of developing the new approaches needed to meet the climate challenge. When seeking opportunities, we should ideally be adapting existing and creating new low carbon businesses and jobs that retain and attract younger people, energetic, motivated younger people who can then operate from their own homes or nearby communities, rebalancing and increasing the population while reducing carbon footprints. We can also do a great deal to strengthen the Highland brand by capitalizing on and enhancing our green credentials, ensuring that our ensuring that our world-class environment, natural heritage, food and drink and so on, are matched by world-class businesses and services in every other department. However, time is against us today, so let me just highlight one particular area where we need to think carefully about how we maximise the opportunities of the green recovery for our local communities. Clearly, many business opportunities lie in the manufacturing, supplying, installing, including retrofitting, and servicing of domestic and business insulation and renew renewable energy systems. But how do we ensure best value? Traditionally, large contracts are let to very large businesses who then send teams out to do the work, staying in local accommodation. But it's time for a change. As we develop investment in, for example, retrofitting buildings, we should be thinking about procurement approaches that prioritize place-based contracts. This would enable smaller contracts to be awarded, which could be won by community-based firms and workers with smaller carbon footprints. And the money would generate a significantly higher return for local economies through the multiplier. We know that one pound spent with a local SME generates 62 pence worth of additional spend. That same pound spent with a large business would only generate an additional 40 pence. So 62 versus 40 really is a no brainer. So to con the conclusion, well, everyone appreciates the clear and present danger presented by climate change and the need to address it. And yes, there are plenty of opportunities out there. But Highland businesses are in a bad way and they need clarity on what Scotland's journey to sustainability looks like. We really do need a consensus view, one that takes the views of businesses into account, or one that recognises the likely impact of any actions on their ability to operate as a whole and by sector and by region, and their ability also to survive. Because we need to understand the cost to the Highlands if businesses start to fail as a result of the new policies and the way that they are implemented. A cost measured in unemployment, uh, a cost measured in declining population, reductions in the quality of life enjoyed by communities and jobs and so on. With this in mind, there are four key messages to politicians and policymakers. One, don't underestimate the magnitude of what has to happen to meet your targets and the likely impact that you are asking visitors, uh, businesses to do on local economies and communities don't underestimate their impact on these. Two, do businesses already struggling due to COVID and other factors and quite possibly in debt as a result really understand what they're going to have to do and the scale of the challenges? If not, when will you tell them? Three, what can they be helped with? Advice, finance and so on. And what can and must they do for themselves? And four, what can you do to help them realise the opportunities that climate change presents, increasing their and to an extent their communities' chances of survival. Well, I hope you found this presentation interesting. Um, if you're running a business and you would like to know what FSB can do to help you meet your ambitions and to help our work in influencing politicians and policymakers, then do take a look at our website. It's fsb.org.uk. And thank you very much for listening. And uh, we hope we meet you in the face, in the reality, in the flesh one day.